I would like everyone to know what the routine is when we get on here. <laughs> oh, yeah, please enlighten me. Well, you know it. <laughs> Everybody else, if you're wondering what it's what it looks like five seconds before we get on, every time, almost 400 episodes in. Okay, now. <laughs> Christine likes to, just in okay, case. Okay, well, maybe just if you wanted to step up and do one, you could do it too. Do To step up and do what? Okay, I thought you were going to complain about how I do the ready set go or whatever oh i wasn't gonna complain about it i was gonna compliment just, it but we oh, could get nasty you? if you'd like were damn you? okay you? <laughs> i don't know in the past you've really made some faces so i was just reading between the lines but anyway go ahead, uh, go ahead. christine likes to just double check with everybody every time well, you you but yes everybody me, me and then like a, a distant eva's ears i suppose maybe yeah like to let all of us know just in case, we're going to press record, and we're mm-hmm. going to go at the same time that the Zoom goes, that the video feature goes. And every time, which is interesting, I do black out right before. And what I, so it is helpful. And what I would like to say is it's interesting how it mirrors the five seconds after we record, which is every single time Christine forgets what episode we, re- we just covered. Oh, and... oh, after we record. Yes, after we hang up or like after the episode ends, then M has to announce the number. I have to say out. the episode number so Christine knows how and to title two, her And her then episode. four seconds later, I go, what was it? 622? And you're like, no, I said 371. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it takes a couple times to really register, but I do thank you for your uh, service in that regard. I, I think it's interesting that you're always... Just you guys having gentle reminders right before, right before, not even a whole minute before, and then I always give a gentle reminder immediately after, not even a, a minute gentle after. Remind. Yeah, I'm the one who needs a reminder. I I think I don't really know how to start the timing. I mean, I think we're supposed to clap also, and I just I, I it gives me so much anxiety to do the clap that I yeah. don't do it, and yeah. I don't know if the, I mean Jack, let us know. Are we making your life a living hell? I'm not sure. Um. I don't but know. But it seems to work so far. So let's <laughs> keep doing it. <laughs> well, someone's clearly in better spirits than last week. Uh, I mean, I am. I- I'm drinking tea, which just never happens. And you know that ba- it's not a good sign, right? Like if I'm drinking tea and not coffee, something is awry. So you're um, still not feeling good. I'm feeling like trash, but I'm better. I'm better. I'm better. I'm better. Okay. I think the thing now is that I'm just like so deeply nauseous. And I, yes, to answer your question, I have taken 72 pregnancy tests because I'm just paranoid at this point. Oh, I didn't been, even think about that. Uh, I sure did. Uh, I've been nauseated for uh, days and it's just getting worse because I can't really eat. And so I think I'm hungry. But then, like, if I try to eat, I just get mm-hmm. sick. Anyway, so I'm drinking tea. Like, what the fuck is that all about? Uh Anyway, I so I'm okay. I'm just really nauseous, but I'm not pregnant. So huzzah! <laughs> All right. That's the uh, good news, folks. <laughs> Leona reigns for another day. L- All right. Literally yesterday in the car, Leona said, "My whole family is here," and I said, "Yeah, it's mommy and daddy, and you're in the back." And she said, "And I'm the baby." And I, in my head, went, knowing I was going to go home and take a pregnancy test, was like, "Oh God." <laughs> please stay that please be the baby i can't yep. do it manifest can't do that it. girl that's exactly right yeah girl you stay the baby for now okay um and so thank god she's still the baby and i'm still a big baby um and i'm yeah. um, i'm my womb is empty and i'm so thrilled uh but i can only drink tea so you know what what good is it i can't even drink wine because i'm so ill so you know what so you might as well be pregnant you might as well be pregnant. Nope. Don't say that. Take that back. Nope. Nope. From nope. the universe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. How are you, M? I am in better spirits. You're right. As you can tell. I even put makeup on. Because last time Ooh. I went downstairs and Blaze said, you look really nice today. And I said, really? M told me I looked like shit. <laughs> I didn't mean it. But I will say it was also through a camera. You're about this big on my screen right now. So maybe I, I was wrong. But I also, I think I just heard it in your voice how miserable you were that any perception of you was gonna it was very funny because blaze said it right afterward and i went is that like his thing does he like my sickly victorian look maybe that's what i need to 
Maybe he's, he's a little that? dastardly like that. Maybe he's Ooh, into dastardly. That. It feels like something plays with you're me. You're not. You're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm very modern. I'm like, get with the program, Christine. Let's you're go. You're like, put on some fucking rouge, okay? <laughs> Come on. Um, How are you? Well, well, not pregnant also. So um, I haven't Congratulations. checked. Congratulations. I just got a feeling. Oh, oh thank God. Yeah. Uh, you know when you know, you know. Uh, no, I don't, because I'm constantly in a state of like, is it possible? And then the world's like, no, you're uh, like, you just had a baby four hours ago, and I'm like, but you never know. I gotta like, say, I, people I who like... are heterosexual and active, I would also be terrified constantly. Yeah, I don't think you get enough. Is, um, I think from from credit. the day I became sexually active, I there are texts going back to like twenty whatever year with Renee that are just like, phew few <laughs> few like every couple months <laughs> like, and there wasn't even it was like we were practicing like I'm, I'm i practice safe sex okay it's just like you know there's that 0.01 percent chance yep. right and you would be the like, one who gets that situation right? so thank you you get it <laughs> i i'd be terrified if i were you i don't know how you live <sighs> in constant fear um, i don't either Anyway, I will, the day will, if I ever get pregnant, that will be a day to really just, the fear will ignite and I won't even, the world will, will absolutely just shiver. I can't um, wait for that. <laughs> I can't, just kidding. I can, and I don't want it. Oh, <laughs> uh, how am I doing? Um, I'm sleepy. We're recording earlier than usual. Um, Sorry. I, I mean, it's not your fault. I also, uh, we're living in chaos because we just got sprayed uh last week for the roaches right. and so we're just living in piles currently because everything had to be like all of our food anything that's ever been in a cabinet is all shoved into the fridge or the freezer or the microwave like it just like it's I feel like you're just, just it's just a little chaotic okay but here. be be careful when you turn the oven on because i've done that where i stored things in the oven and then i preheated the oven I mean, so do we not remember like episode one when my very first uh, oh, roommate yeah! on this episode like left a toaster in the oven or something? That Egyptian guy set your kitchen on fire. I forgot about that. He melted it. He melted everything in there. Good it was times. like, well, I melted everything in there, but it's because he left everything in there and I didn't he know. He left a toaster in the oven. Who does that? Besides in me. hindsight, unbeknownst to me, I, apparently that's a cultural thing. I've I've been oh. told that that's that a, by a few people that like apparently they just a lot of people that are like egyptian have used ovens as extra storage which i guess oh, makes sense it does but make at the sense. time well, I had i've no done idea. it many times i think it makes perfect sense but i've just ended up with a fire extinguisher you know as part of the problem as part of the solution and problem. yeah it never even occurred to me that it i i get it but I had not lived with that experience before. And yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. melted everything. And you know, it's like um, when they say, like, go out and live in the world. <laughs> yeah. Go learn <laughs> <Sorry>. something. <laughs> go live in the world. You get it. Go learn a thing or two. And then, like, at the end of your days, you're on your deathbed. And you're like, wow, I learned that sometimes in Egypt <laughs> you used to use an oven as storage. And sometimes my friend Christine did that also. Uh, yeah. So yep. you know what it, we've we've really grown as people on this earth. I think. They, oh, thank God. First lesson: check it off. Um, check. <laughs> and what else? I, I mean, I don't really have anything going on right now. I'm about to go uh, to Pittsburgh before you do a little exploring. Yeah. Wait. Are you flying out tonight? Yeah. Wow. Like a red eye. Yeah, which I'm kind of upset oh. about. I I wanted to leave earlier because now I'm only going to have one full day before Pittsburgh to do stuff. I like to try to do at least I one and a half, if Pittsburgh. not two. Um, and I think I'm probably going to, because I'm, there's a lot on my itinerary I'd like to get done and I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm really struggling with like, re, like just fucking relaxing. I liked, I think I've been using travel as like a place to focus my hyper fixations mm. and i've been thinking like oh like i'm really gonna take advantage of travel this year and i'm really gonna take advantage of the fact that we're going to so many cities that are really cool and i've never been to and i want to explore so if i only get a certain window of time i have to mm -hmm. really carpe diem like the make shit the of most that. of it yeah 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 i got you and so then that adds the pressure of like 
letting things slip through the cracks. I've been waking up super early and going to bed super late, just trying to do as many things as possible because I don't know when I'll be back in that city to a point where I'm now like falling asleep backstage because I'm like, you literally, <laughs> we were sitting there. I'm not kidding. Eva, no, I'm only talking about it because you brought it up. Well, I was not going to put you on the spot, but now I will. Uh, oh, well, Eva you, told me later, it was like, you fell asleep backstage and I like didn't even notice myself. Not are off. you serious? I, okay. You were genuinely like, <laughs> yeah yeah my friend you were we're sitting there just having a perfectly normal conversation like literally 25 minutes before the show um what show was that that was when we were up in that makeshift green room and they brought us all that great Mm -hmm. cheese yeah see that's how i remember shows i don't know what town i'm in ever but i know it was great yeah Um, we remember them by the green rooms yeah so we were back there and we were like eva and i were coloring the tarot cards you got her and having a grand old time and talking real loud and then all of a sudden you hear (sighs) And we look over, and I don't even mean over. Like, I mean, we're all three sitting in a little circle. And Em is just sitting there in a chair with their head back and just, like, <laughs> old man in a barca lounger, like, asleep. And even I just, like, look at each other and kind of start laughing. But then we're, like, getting a little loud. But then it's very clear you're not going to wake up no matter what. So we just went back mm-hmm. to our activities. But you really were just snoozing. And then Eva and I were so nervous because we were like, well, we don't want to wake up wake them up two minutes before the show then they're gonna have like a freak out you know because yeah, like, they yeah. haven't adjusted to the waking world their body has left the building so i don't know you eventually woke yourself up and we just pretended like we didn't see you just snore for you know, 10 minutes but <laughs> it looked like quite a delightful power nap you got you know yeah well I, I yeah i don't really know what happened there although i mean i've been trying this thing where i'm like for a, a long time up until this tour, I mm-hmm. have been so truly, I don't know another word, but catatonic, paralyzed yes. with fear. <laughs> there doesn't the need idea. to be another word. Catatonic is encapsulates the entire essence of your being. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not who, like what you're hearing and, and to all the people who like are writing online, like, oh, I'd love to meet you. If you ever it, met me right before a show, you, you, I'm and not some have. this. And some have. some have, and I feel bad. I still think about them. I'm like, oh my god, they got the worst experience ever. No, because you, you always apologize, which is so sweet. You're like, I'm sorry, I'm like this right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're always very, very kind and understanding, but yeah, you you really aren't feeling it. Well, I've always been, um, like, I've been. I'm trying really hard. Shout out to Jordan. All the therapy is like going okay so far. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm a different person backstage than I have been in the past. You are. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is instead of in the past, I would just like lie in the hotel room and just like think about like, th- like at some point today, I have to leave the hotel and get in a car and go to the theater. And, and yeah, your, your have anxiety to experience is just my cycling fright. and cycling and cycling. Yeah. Yeah, so now I'm trying to do a thing where, like, I force myself to leave the hotel room and the show just feels like another thing for the day where it just feels like... I like that. It's like an a errand, list. essentially. Yeah. Which, like, not that I don't want other people to think, you know, anything negative on that, but I think my brain has to treat it as something smaller than it is. So <clears throat> I've been that's trying very, to... very smart. I've been trying to do a lot of stuff before and after. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a whole day and then I'm going to get to the theater... I do a quick little show, quick little show, quick little show. And then I'm like going to go to the bars and I'm going to go out and try this restaurant. Okay, 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 okay. I forgot about this. And this is so funny because I meant to bring this up. Blaze and I were just talking about this. And he reminded me because I had been drinking. So I was like, I don't totally. I mean, I I wasn't blacked out, but I was like, there was so much going on. I didn't really remember. But Blaze remembered in Chicago, (laughs) the day of the show. (laughs) What? (laughs) I was so funny the day the place still talks about the day of the show uh so we did the show in chicago it was great it was awesome my sister came um i found a peephole and like looked at everybody inappropriately like a little pervert it was a whole thing anyway we'll talk about that another time but as we were leaving the car was waiting outside and uh so we all get in the car and Emma is like, oh, I'm and blaze uh came to the sh- wait yeah blaze came to the show as well so he got in the car with us and my sister and we're all heading back to the hotel and Em is like, oh, I'm going to go out and see some bars tonight and go bar hopping and see some sights. And I'm like, I'm going to bed. And so we're on our way back and 
we're about to the car's about to start and M goes oh wait I just realized that the first place I want to visit is only 150 feet from here and so like M like yeets themselves out of the car and says hey you take the suitcase and I'm like okay and M runs off right so we're about to get going we're like all right I think we're all set let's go and like the guy turns the car on we're about to go and M comes right back leans through into the back row of seats and goes Christine can I have ten dollars for cover and I'm like (laughs) what am I your dad so I'm like okay so I like go through my bag and I'm I mean it's tour money like it's money that like is a communal for us to use so it wasn't like i was like loney but you were like can i have ten dollars and so it was like here's ten dollars go buy yourself an ice cream and you go running <laughs> off into the middle of the night like at 11 30 at night and blaze was like it was the wildest thing em just ran back and asked you for 10 bucks and then just fucking bolted off to off to i don't know see the sights uh go live <laughs> the nightlife you know um, i do remember thinking i was one like of the i don't know I was like, I don't think they've ever seen me run before, but I was running because I knew I was about to miss the car. (laughs) You were running. You were like, I need that 10 bucks for cover. And I was like, first of all, the fact that you don't drink and they still want to cover from you is incredibly rude. Like, yeah, well, hey, I I can agree. Oh, wait, I guess it's not because you're not going to spend the money on booze. So maybe they want you to spend the money on. Anyway, I definitely spend um, more money on a cover than I do on my own mocktail. That's four dollars. But um, true. But I do think it's funny that like. First of all, I never have cash on me ever. Um, I know. You would think covers these days it. they would just have like the square and be like just tap You'd your phone. You'd think so because I, I I was so shook that I even had ten bucks, but it's only because Willie Nelson has been apparently giving gas money to artists who are touring, and so sometimes we yeah. go to a show <laughs> and a venue's like, "Oh, Willie Nelson gave this to you," and we're like, "What?" And they're like, "Well, he gave it to everybody, not just you." But yeah, it feels I, very I, special. I, uh, Willie Nelson uh, is responsible for like half of the tour merch I have now. Like and like, yeah, he's he, given he, us laundry bags for oh, our suitcases and game changer. Yeah. They even say on the road again because I guess he's doing this like thing with venues where he's like helping pay kind of like offset the cost of like gas and things like that for when you're touring. So it's been awesome. But basically, Willie Nelson, I call him Uncle Billiam, but he paid for your cover. I, I just kind of was the middleman, so to speak. You know. Um, when that gets lost in translation, yes, Willie Nelson did come to a bar with me, and he he paid my <laughs> he cover did. charge. It was so nice. <laughs> it was so thoughtful of him. <gasps> um, he wants you to have a good time, so I'm glad Thank you're you. exploring more and having a. It seems to me, as an outsider, but it seems like you have really been. Um, I don't know, finding finding your chutzpah again. Well, thank you. Your All that to say, life. I'm a little, I'm a little bummed that I'm not going to be having the amount of time that I would usually like in Pittsburgh because well, one Pittsburgh day does only not feel four like hours enough. from my house, and I love Pittsburgh. So if you ever want to do a little roadie trip, you could do a little roadie, roadie trip in the direction of the show you have the next day, and you could come hang out with me. I am. I'm flying out tomorrow. Oh, I thought you were coming in the next day. Okay. No, Fine. I'm flying tomorrow. Fine. You you win that. Now one. you're trapped. Now you're trapped into hanging out with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, quickly, let's talk about a story before it gets Change like even hotter in here all of a sudden. Oh, God. Okay, I ha- I do have a really uh a story for you. Uh a, a, uh one that I spent quite a lot of time on. And I'm very excited about. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Um I don't know how this hasn't been covered before. But we are covering the Dakota. Is that a boat? It sounds like a boat, but it's not. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't. I don't expect you to know. Okay. <laughs> but uh, this is a building on Central Park West and West Seventy Second Street in New York. <gasps> I've heard of this. Oh, so you do know what's going on? I think so. A little tiny bit. Okay. I tried to add in a lot of fun facts for you. I can't wait. Okay. So this building was established in 1880 and was finished in 1884. Like it took those four years to be built. It's called the Dakota building and it's a luxury apartments for the rich and famous. Mm, That's why I know about it. Apparently very haunted. Remember when Um, I knew about it, but really I thought it was a boat. So clearly I don't know anything about it. The range of knowledge in the last two minutes from you has been interesting because you went from I don't know to aha, aha, here we are. I'm rich and famous, so (laughs) I sure do know. 
Uh, you're definitely not rich or famous enough for the Dakota. I'll tell you that they would laugh Certainly in your face. Not. And... I th- again, once again, let me clarify. I thought it was a big boat, so I am <laughs> I'm not the person I, to ask. I think if you tried to go in there, they would say, uh, you're not welcome here, but there is an old dirty boat. You could probably sleep on somewhere. So, <laughs> oh, you're looking for that Dakota. Yes. Please go under one of the bridges. You'll find it there. Uh, there. So this building was originally headed by Edward Clark, who was the sewing machine magnate. There had to be one. Uh, What about Singer? He founded the Singer Manufacturing Company. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Uh, This building was also designed by the same guy who did the Plaza Hotel and the Waldorf Astoria. Ooh la la. So immediately swanky. Edward Clark Uh said, this is what we're doing, and it's going to be big. And it's going to have beautiful little crown molding. Probably. 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 Mm. Uh, The complex originally had 65 apartments. um, But when I say apartments, I don't obviously mean my like dirty roach infested apartment. I mean, like these apartments (laughs) are. With a toaster in the stove. (laughs) (laughs) Like these apartments are Gossip Girl apartments where like they're. Like I've never understood. It's such a a baffling concept to me when rich people are living in obviously not an actual apartment and call it an apartment. I get that it's like stacked homes on right. in one building. I get it. Do you but think like, they call it an apartment or do, is there another word for it? Like Serena Vanderwoodson my... did on Gossip Girl. She did. Okay. Yeah. She well, like, that's that's that then. That answers that question. I don't know any tighter source. So true. Um. <laughs> but yeah it's, and they call it apartments all throughout every note that i found i mean they call them apartments and but apparently there were supposed to be 65 of them each of these apartments ranged from four bedrooms poor gross to mm. like 20 rooms each all right acceptable yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so originally 65 each with like let's say an average of like a dozen rooms each and now instead of 65 apartments it's 103 because the stables that came with this remember it was built in the 1880s so they needed a place for their horses uh those that's the stables have now been turned into their own condo so they added even more apartments after that oh my one source said that this building is nicknamed the dracula instead of the dakota because of its dark menacing appearance um and it was it does look kind of like it's a little spooky um it's like gothic style very gothic yeah mm. but it does have obviously all the modern amenities it's essentially a five-star resort they had all the things that the vander woodsons would love with like <laughs> a clay tennis courts grass croquet courts a rose Ooh. garden soundproof walls fireproof staircases room service a restaurant inside a laundry system uh or a laundry service a gym 24 7 round the clock housekeeping staff elevator operators and it had its own in-house power plant so the ac would never go out or the heat would never Uh, go out okay my priority is the laundry i don't really care about anything else but the laundry service man i could use that i could use that too but also i wonder if they even have well in the 1880s i was like where are their own washing machines why do they have to have shared laundry services i understand in the 1880s okay yeah yeah um (laughs) the building also has original gas lamps from when the building was built whoa and they're still at the front entrance and their boilers are so powerful that they could heat everything in a four block radius if it wanted to oh my god but they don't want to they don't no. We could help others, but we won't. No, no, no. no. But why would we? <laughs> Fun fact, Edward Clark, the founder of this place, his apartment here, this is so fucking bougie, had sterling silver floors. What? <laughs> so Can they you... have to polish the fucking floors to make sure they don't tarnish. That's what I was going to say. Can you imagine the polishing? I can't imagine a more inconvenient floor. I mean, truly like the worst best. Like if you're looking for... Like the most obnoxious material. Like proof of status. That's it. Yeah. Like you would have to hire, again, round the clock care for your floor. And like, like also it would always smell like shoe polish. It would be silver polish. They'd be just like down there, like tiny little Part of it would always the look like gross because they're just scrubbing into it. 
<sighs> and also, are they on their hands and knees? Unless he created for sure, these. Unless he created some oversized, yeah, mop or something. I doubt it. I'm sure they I were down there. Yeah. Um. Another fun fact: I mentioned that there were fireproof stairs. Uh -huh. What I meant by that is that the architect wanted to avoid fire escapes. Yikes. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> so unsightly. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, one, probably because they were unsightly. Two, the, I think the plan from the beginning was the rich and famous would be living here. And so I think it was supposed to be like a safety thing in terms of creepy people. Oh, like, to climb up. Okay, got you, got you, got you, got you. Like, let's not, let's not let people be able to get in any other way except through to the access. front door. Gotcha, okay. But still, this place is just like a walking fire hazard. Um, right, right. So they fireproof the stairs. The architect literally, there's a quote, slathered mud from Central Park between the layers of brick flooring. What? <laughs> so that just to... Just to give it extra insulation or something? I mean, it soundproofed it and fireproofed them, so... Sure, and, I do like the idea of a whole building for the rich and famous already being soundproofed. Because can you imagine the Gatsby parties? And if you're a oh, musician, imagine. if you're a musician, you know that you're not going to bother your tenants. Yeah, I like that. So it's a fun little. And if you're a if you're a wealthy thought. serial killer, nobody will right. know. No one will hear your screams. Exactly. That's right. So anyway, the building somehow since the beginning has not needed fire escapes which is lovely but <laughs> there are 10 floors and over 100 apartments and no fire escapes cool. so when the day comes we'll uh, hear when it. <laughs> okay whoa i that's mean ominous not to be not to be i mean it's amazing there hasn't been a single well i'm safety sure nowadays, issue right? since they 80, have to 1880s. have like but they have to have like updated it to code right like legally somehow i don't know maybe i i don't know I didn't look that far. I didn't want to know. I like the mystery. Okay. Um, another fun fact, because this place does look a little creepy. This building was did all the exterior shots for the movie Rosemary's Baby. The <gasps> That's why I've heard of it. Uh, not that I've seen that film, obviously. But uh, I have. I've, re I've listened to an episode on this. I think Lore or something. But it was a very Ooh. short one. So I, I only know the bare bones. Well, yeah, so in the book Rosemary's Baby that I guess the movie was adapted from, mm. in the book, the hotel or the apartment complex is called the Bramford. And I I, I was a little confused. There was one source that I think said that the Bramford was inspired by this building. Like, this is literally the Bramford that someone wrote about and just changed oh. the name in the book. Or this building just looked so similar to what people thought the Bramford would look like that they filmed the I see, okay. there. So I don't know chicken or the egg. I don't know which one, hmm. but anyway, this is, if you've wanted to see it before, if you've watched Rosemary's baby, you have seen it. Notable residents who have been here, uh, because these are like the upper class of the upper class, the, the echelon, upper echelon, if you will, Ooh. notable residents, of the Dakota have been, and since this started in the 1880s, these are people that maybe we don't know, but they were very famous <laughs> oh, for their great. time. <laughs> okay, uh, gotcha. Lauren Bacall, who was um, Humphrey Bogart's mom. Mm -hmm. uh, St the Steinway family of Steinway Steinway pianos. Pianos. The uh, the author um, Harlan Coben, Bono, mm. uh, Tchaikovsky, Boris Jesus. Karloff who uh was frankenstein or which yeah. is like so interesting that frankenstein moved into the, the dracula the gothic yeah the dracula yeah true <laughs> rosemary clooney or george clooney's mom rosemary's uh, baby rosemary's baby <laughs> connie chung judy garland and wow. mr maury povich shut the fuck up <laughs> he he made it i don't know how but he come made on it. maury okay um now, here are some celebrities who have been rejected, um, which is wild because when I think of, like, Maury Povich, I'm like, in my mind, even though he's uh -huh. rich and famous, I'm like, the echelon is dropping, I think. I feel like it's not, like, this. he's rich and famous, but, I, yeah, I would say he maybe doesn't have, like, the same status uh, mm -hmm, the in, air. in the social sphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, hmm. But so he made it, but guess mm -hmm. who didn't make it? Cher. Who? 
No way. Guess who didn't make it? Billy Joel. Guess Ken? who didn't make it? Madonna. And Is it, they're all singers. Is that something? I don't know. Maybe maybe oh. the the property managers soundproofing. really liked watching Maury, you know? <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe the soundproofing wore off. They were like, we're not chair. Get out of here. <laughs> right exactly that mud, that mud in the in the floor doesn't really work very well we yeah. that. uh <laughs> chair billy joel madonna carly simon alex rodriguez or a rod um judd apatow and oh my God. power couple antonio banderas and uh melanie griffith who by the way have a daughter named dakota um dakota uh-huh. johnson and i just watched her awful awful movie madam web I, so- in- I saw your tiktok beyond i mean i went in I knowing love it dakota. Was be bad. i love dakota though i love her her interviews for this movie are hysterical because you can Is tell that awkward? she's just Is she like she's just fulfilling a contract like she clearly i think she also is not super stoked about this movie <laughs> yeah so. i saw your tiktok about it i didn't know what was happening but i read the comments and kind of figured it out but um there were comments like oh poor dakota <laughs> <laughs> I, it's very clear that i think she needed the paycheck or wanted the paycheck or whatever and now she's just handling her obligations but yeah. in the interviews the things that she <laughs> she, she they're like tell me about the movie and she's like well it's a movie she's like do i have to <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway so those are some people who got rejected apparently applicants have to go through like years and years and years and years of taxes and financial statements just to oh like even qualify to live here so now um, we know maury is a very upstanding financially savvy he's guy got, i guess he's got himself a good money manager i guess great for him um but apparently some people have been leaving in the last few years uh when then when they sold their apartments they said that they're noticing the building is no longer like focused towards creatives and it's more like they're just picking rich people, which uh, I don't know really how I feel about that. Hmm. I, it's just a fun fact for everybody else, I guess. Um, but I feel like I would also probably just, if, if my whole thing is rich and famous people, maybe the famous part is really inconvenient or like the creatives part is like, Maybe it is really loud. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Or maybe it's supposed to be like a safe haven where, you know, they can all live in apartments and not feel like they're being stared at. I don't know what the upside of either like side is. That must have hurt Maury's feelings. <laughs> He's like, I'm very Rich. creative. He's <laughs> like, well, where, is that how I got in then? Hey. <laughs> well, fun fact. Uh, again, the Dakota is one of the most haunted buildings in New York. Or one of the most haunted apartment buildings in New York, and it's even allegedly cursed. And this theory is a little wild, but not. I feel like it still gets like at least like a little footnote. It's a fun little mention that mm. someone has the theory that because the in-house power plant has a, a lot of electrical energy, plus all of the celebrities that live here, their creative energy together. Mm go hand in hand fist bump and create powerful spiritual energy and that's why this place is really haunted like okay i think that's giving the celebs a little too much credit but you know maybe not (laughs) or that power plant i don't know um or the power plant (laughs) yeah so the paranormal history goes back at least to the 1930s which would be only 50 years of the building being around it could be earlier but we at least know through the 1930s there were spirits here in the 1930s, the ghost of Edward Clark, the founder himself, mm. he appeared in the basement to multiple electricians who would go down there. Um, oh. There's one report of an electrician showing up and in the basement running into a short but very long-nosed man. Short but long-nosed. Okay. And he had a big beard. And apparently this guy approached him glared really intensely at him and then ripped his own toupee off and started shaking it around oh dear and apparently it happened i think like four times after that like like electricians just kept having this happen to them in the basement which like oh my god what does it mean like what What does it mean (laughs) what a cipher i'll uh, like (laughs) what the fuck that is one way to leave a lasting impression as a ghost i would say i Uh, I feel like i feel like um 
some of the the sites I was looking at, their theory was like maybe he was just so mad at how a previous elect uh, electrician did it that there's residual energy of a time where he got so mad he just started like <laughs> rattling around. But like, why would you rip your own hair off and then? Shake I mean, it I've around? tried to rip my own hair out out of frustration, but yeah, <laughs> I imagine someone with such decorum as this guy, as this very wealthy mm. man with sterling floors. It really surprises <laughs> me that that's kind of his lasting image. It honestly doesn't shock me that someone with sterling silver floors actually was a bit of a loose screw. Like, that's, like okay, fair. Oh, you know what? Fair point. A little point. too tightly wound. A little bit. So apparently they didn't know who this guy was until the electrician actually saw a painting of him and realized that it was the <laughs> founder of the building. And then they like covered up. He like saw a painting and then he like covered up the hair and was like, yeah, they had oh, to repaint yeah, it that on. That is the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> now I recognize him. There's a guy also uh, that haunts this place named Joe. He thought that the, that the Dakota was haunted. And when he died, more activity than ever kicked up in this building. Mm. Doors would lock and unlock themselves, open and close themselves. The elevators would start and stop themselves. And this was at a time when they were like manually operated elevators. The trash bags would levitate, which I didn't oh. know you and I could levitate. <laughs> Thank you for including yourself in that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You and you also. Um, is what yeah. I meant. You. <laughs> yeah. Cheap shot, I either, but I had to do it. Good for us. But yeah, just a bunch of like little random stuff would happen. People started noticing a darker spirit in the basement. And uh, one employee apparently said that this big, heavy shovel got thrown at him from across the room. Oh. And people started smelling pipe smoke when nobody was around. People started seeing a little girl in the windows and small fires started mysteriously starting themselves. Okay, well they're testing out this mud f mud theory. I, I know, think. like you would think the the one building that doesn't have fire escapes, please don't be the one that please also sets don't fires by itself. This your pyromania here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> not the place please do it like down the road at the boat with a, a fire escape apparently put the <laughs> the boat is in the water do it there <laughs> uh one this one's i i only got this from one source but it was weird enough that it has to get mentioned there's an elevator that apparently mysteriously gets knife cuts all through its interior yeah? and it has to regularly be refinished because <gasps> people just walk in and there's just small knife cuts all over the elevator ew that's gross the spirit that does this to the elevator has been nicknamed the Phantom of the Dakota and the Mad Slasher, but not the Hash Slinging Slasher. Which is... <laughs> the Hash Slinging Slasher. I wow, that the Mad Slash. I mean, that's alarming. If you're in like a a but it sounds like an episode of only murders in the building like there's like a yeah. slasher in the beautiful apartment complex you know also like imagine okay if you work in hotels please don't you're you didn't hear this part but like one of my favorite things to do when we're traveling is like go exploring through the hotel at night sure and is. but imagine i mean that's just it's that's karma waiting to happen as you're just standing in an elevator that cuts itself like now yeah i'm in yeah. trouble well i don't want to be no. in that elevator by myself I would sure wouldn't either. And like, is the knife there? Is the knife invisible? Is the what knife? What if you're about to take your like floating? lovely old sweet mother to dinner? You're riding the elevator, and all of a sudden, bam! Cut! Bam! It's just cut! Like, slash! Slash! Yeah. Slice. That's when you take your enemy there, and then you say, "Oh, I'll get the next one," and you just leave them in that elevator. You say, "Okay, hit the alarm, hit the emergency stop button," and then you go, "Get her, boys!" You know, just good seems... luck. <laughs> um i mentioned the ghost of a little girl this little girl has apparently been seen quite a lot there's the ghost of a girl wearing a yellow dress bouncing a red ball they're always bouncing a damn ball Ugh, god and then what is with the ball it feels like it was the halfway point between our fun and hoop and stick it's like well there was a whole <laughs> era of ghosts where they just had a ball and that was it's like it. man they didn't they didn't even know what they were missing i know <laughs> And they didn't even have internet to look back and hear about hoop and stick. They didn't even know what fun happened before God, them. Telling they just you, thought, it's just sad this, days. This red ball is the most fun any of us have ever had. Ugh, tragic. So she's bouncing this red ball. She's wearing a yellow dress. Sometimes she's seen crying. And oh. one time a construction crew saw her. And this is the only time that I saw recorded. But when the construction crew saw her, 
she stopped bouncing the ball. She turns and looks at them. And then she says, today is my birthday. <laughs> and then she leaves. And you know it wasn't her birthday. She just wanted some attention. <laughs> she just That's wanted to see if they give child. her a shiny nickel for the soda shop. Yeah. She's like, I need a new ball to play with. Uh, yeah, this one's losing its bounce. You know how it goes. Um, <laughs> it's my birthday. Disappear. That's I kind feel of like the funniest thing I've ever heard. I like that she was a little manipulative. I love it. But, I love it. So get this. After the group saw her, and she's the only one that's ever up, like turned to them, acknowledged them, said something. Right. Then shortly after, one of the guys of the construction crew fell down one of the stairs and died. Oh, shit. And so this led people to think that she is like an omen and if she stops and talks to you you're fucked oh my god it's my birthday and i want to watch one of you fall like what now you die yeah so if you see her maybe don't give her too much attention or if you do just hope she doesn't say hi back just say happy birthday i think that's all she wants oh unless that means i'm asking for it good point i'll let you say happy birthday and then we'll see what happens Okay, if we ever see her, we'll each react completely differently and see what happens. I yeah. will just watch you react, oh. and I will be around the corner. Okay. For science. Well, mm-hmm. Eva, get in there. I'm excited because I'll also be at the coffee shop, but you you tell us how it goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Em is with me behind the, around the corner. Eva's there <laughs> talking to the ghost child. It's like at the Queen Mary when we were both behind the corridor while we watched her check us out early because we were too embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened before it'll happen again and she knows it uh so this little girl when she's not apparently a harbinger for doom uh, <laughs> <laughs> she is seen smiling and waving to people she's also seen walking into rooms and sometimes even closets because i wonder if blueprint theory there used to be a room there Ooh, i like that i like that a lot there's one couple here who I checked. It is not who you think it is, but their last name was Weinstein, and they were rich oh, and famous. But it was well, not, it's not related, who we're thinking. right? Uh, what's that? They're probably related, right? Sorry. I don't know. All I know is it's not okay. it's not he who shall not be named. Okay, um, great. But uh, a Weinstein couple lived uh, at the Dakota. And they also said, this place is totally haunted. We hear footsteps in the apartment at night. Apparently their chairs and their like heavy rugs would move on their own. Yuck. Ugh. Which like a rug is under other things. So is everything yeah, that... moving? Yeah. Is it like they're just shifting it? Maybe they're trying to do that magic trick where you pull it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pull a whatever tablecloth. Yeah, yeah. 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 I hope so. That'd be fun. Mm, and do it when there's fun. like a whole dinner party on top of the rug and just knock yeah, everyone that would out. Be, especially if you have some candelabras lit. This place mm. is fireproof. Remember? Wow, you're really, you could, I know that you have already done the writing prompt for that last story, but this could be something. Remember this for <laughs> your next contest okay, you that, enter. Eva, write that down, please. Thank you. Uh, Well, it was already haunted, but one day the husband was coming home and he looked up at the window to see what was going on in his apartment and he saw a whole ass chandelier hanging from his ceiling and he was like, oh, my wife must have bought a chandelier today and had it installed, which... To be that rich. I can't even imagine. Oh, um, she must have installed, the, had the new crystal, the Swarovski. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Fancy. Uh, when he got upstairs, though, there was no chandelier. But when he huh? looked closer, he looked at the ceiling and he saw that old bolts were installed <gasps> in the ceiling where a chandelier oh, once hung. Oh, shit. So he like saw a phantom chandelier that used to be there. It's kind of like those... Um, stories we've talked about where there's like a time warp or like you can see into a different time slip a time slip time slip i love Um, a time slip this is probably my favorite story i'll tell is that boris karloff who played frankenstein he was i think the first actor to move into the dakota and when he moved in it very much matched his creepy vibe of being frankenstein and now being in this really creepy building but he this uh, one, I guess he reportedly once said that it made him sad that all the kids were scared of him because he's literally fucking Frankenstein. Oh, uh, is he Frankenstein or Frankenstein's monster? I would argue both are scary. Frankenstein's monster. Oh, okay. But... I didn't know. I genuinely didn't know if that's who he played or if he played like the guy, Dr. Frankenstein. 
I know, I know, but it, it's I, the I, I wasn't it's the sure. one okay. that the children would be I scared just, of. Well, that's fine because now we'll get we won't get the tweets, you know. So, well, he apparently he once said that like it always made him sad that like on Halloween he would leave out like a bowl of candy and nobody oh. would ever come. Which like, can you imagine? You literally live next to Frankenstein and it's Halloween. That's uh, yeah. Come on, exactly where you Count go your for your damn candy. blessings. Children. That's exactly where you go. I can't imagine Ugh. like. Devin Sawa, a ghost, Casper, like, or, or uh, uh, what's his name? Bella Lugosi, vampire. Oh, like, now that would be creepy. Like, any, or like a witch. Who has ever like a witch. Bette Midler. Bette Midler. Anyone from Halloween Town. Mm. I feel like if you are living amongst, if you live next to one of the, the charmed sisters and you don't mm. go to their house first and last. And the, it's the only one in the middle. If you don't go there for your candy on Halloween, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it so wrong. Also, how many kids are in this building? Like two. I feel like this sounds like a place where kids are not really, kids are like frowned upon, you know? I feel like in the middle of all your financial statement meetings, they're like, mm, do you have those? Ooh, yeah. That, that's gotta be, yeah, that's though. probably a big like red flag. If you're applying to this place, I would argue. It, I think it depends on the age. Like, how troublesome are they going to be to the rest of us? But then again, the, are, the whole place is learned, soundproofed. Have they learned to polish silver flooring? Because if they're <laughs> able to contribute in that way, maybe they're welcome. You know, I never saw a little kid in a single episode of Gossip Girl. Everyone was at least 14. Great point. So maybe no you have to be ones. a high schooler. No toddlers. So anyway, Frankenstein just really wanted the kids to... Sad like him which again this this is another writing prompt for a writing contest is like frankenstein the monster just actually wants love um oh uh, i mean i think that is the entire story of frankenstein this monster is it that he wants but, love well yeah, dr frankenstein wants a, a person yes but then it's that the monster is i actually really liked that book it was like one of the few that i actually read in high school and it's really sad he like tries to find uh belonging but the mm. the, the villagers are like so it, it does feel like he's almost mirroring like interesting his actual character well apparently one of the kids who did used to go trick-or-treating there remembers a ghost story after boris karloff died <gasps> where she was going trick-or-treating with her friends and uh she remembers going through the halls with her friends and feeling politely followed and a few times even looked behind her and saw a very tall man just kind of watching them from behind. Ooh. And when they got to an elevator, the man who had been following them in a way that didn't make her feel weird, I guess, but like was just like kind of keeping an eye on them. The yeah. They got to the elevator. That same man got on with them, but all of them like didn't want to look him in the face because they didn't want to like stare or anything they just yeah knew that he was there when they when the kids got off at their stop on the elevator they got off to let the man out too and he vanished <gasps> do they think it was him boris i think they they claim it was boris karloff checking on them and spending time with the kids on halloween like he, he wants wanted. to have friends that's all frankenstein turning into a ghost is the only frankenstein plot twist i don't think i've heard of so <laughs> Another ghost that people see in the Dakota is a woman in white, of fucking course, but she's carrying a <laughs> rose. And oh, she God. said, Oh, God, that's sinister. Uh, yeah, isn't it? It's like something. I don't know why. It's that one weird. subtle cha change. Um, she's said to be the mistress of a married man who lived in the building. And oh, no. when he wouldn't end his marriage for her, she took her own life. And when she died, apparently in that exact same moment she died, her ghost appeared in front of the husband and his wife. Um, oh. <laughs> LOL. That's She's a got power the move. last word. Yep. Well, so freaked out, the husband then runs to her place to, to be like, what did I just see? Finds her body <gasps> and she's holding a rose. Ooh, ah, yuck. And you know and so, that was probably some symbolic thing between them, you know? Ugh. Well, now Oof. it's said that only unfaithful men and their wives can see her. So if you're at the Dakota and you are a woman or a man, if you're married to someone and you're not cheating and you see her, they're cheating. Uh oh. Whoopsies. She is just wreaking havoc. And I love that for her. 
Gemini. I already know. Mm, indeed. No She's doubt. She's like, by the way, I'm stuck here for eternity. I'm going to stir the fucking pot. Why not? You know, something to watch. I would be like, oh, and another thing. Well, I would too, especially if it's in the name of like, um, you know, protecting relationships. Although I guess she's the one who was also cheat. Well, no, she, the husband was cheating with her, right? And so mm-hmm. then, so now I, she goes around and and tells on people. Okay, gotcha. I I wonder if it's because he wouldn't end the marriage and she got bamboozled. She's serving as a warning for other women. It's like, right. girl, if you see me, run, and not because Just I'm run. a ghost, but because your husband is trash. <laughs> Don't run yet. Let me explain. <laughs> <laughs> um. Another notable resident here was Judy Holiday, who was an Oscar, Tony, and Golden Globe winner. She lived here with a in name like Judy Holiday. She better be right. I feel like some people are just born for it's the gotta stage. Got to be a stage name, right? Judy Holiday. What a name! I, I like Julie to think I'd be Holiday. like, "What's my stage name?" But I don't know. I guess it's M. Schultz. But... I guess it's the M. Schultz. Okay, the wait, M. wait. What? Guess what Judy Holiday's real birth name is? What? <laughs> I, uh, I, it could be anything. Stella. Judith Judith Tuvim. Yeah, it had to be changed. Yeah, it had to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> but which is, it's really, uh, she was born Judith Tuvim. She took her stage name from Yom Tovim, which is Hebrew for holidays. Hmm. Interesting. So, that Judy Holiday. That's really actually a cool little twist. Uh, well, she lived there in the 60s, and when she died, the new tenants of her place hired a crew for renovations. And if there's one thing we've learned in almost 400 episodes, <gasps> you renovations Careful. bring the ghosts out for sure. For um, sure. The crew saw an apparition of a man body and a boy's face on the man body. A so man a grown-ass is- man with a... Maybe he just had like a little like baby face. I don't know, but Maybe apparently it's Frankenstein's monster 2.0. Like yeah, <laughs> Frankenstein was at it again <laughs> with his hijinks. <laughs> he loves a hijink. He love it. Loves it. Well, they see this guy, and he never says anything to them, but they felt very closely watched for the rest of the day. Yeah. And the boy has been seen other times walking up and down the halls, and apparently always has a strange musty smell coming from him. <gasps> I don't like it. Me either. And I, like, and there's no explanation, so I don't even feel wait, better so, about that. Ooh, no, I don't feel better either. So wait, so it's a man's body with a boy's face on it, and he smells mm-hmm. musty. Smells musty and just That's doesn't speak. Upsetting. Just walks around. This sounds like a Goosebumps book. It something. does. Dun, 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 dun. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, so one of the painters actually had to go back to the Dakota at some point and do a touch up. And I guess he was one of the people who saw this man boy and he witnessed doors slamming by themselves, lights turning off on their own. And then he felt someone grab his arm and drag him towards the light bulbs he was working near. Oh no. And oh, no. you can believe it. He, he didn't come back. I wouldn't. Oh, I, I wouldn't either. Certainly. The not. second I wouldn't have you're come grabbed. Back the first time. Never again. No, no, no. Don't touch me, you know? I was willing to tolerate a lot of bullshit until someone physically touched me. Now now we're done. We're done here. Um, Today, Leona said something so funny. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't that funny. But to me, it was very funny because she's never seen Frozen. Like, I've not for lack of trying. I've, like, tried to show her a few things. But she's, like, Daniel Tiger only, you know, or Coco mm. Melon Lane only. A loyalist. But so, a loyalist indeed. And uh, which I get, you know. You're you're the same way. You only watch Degrassi or something, um, <laughs> so I get it. But I uh, today she asked me to draw a snowman, and so I was like, "Do you want to build a snowman?" And she goes, "Anna, stop!" And I said, "What?" <laughs> First of all, I thought she was saying, "Mom, stop!" But then she's like, "Anna, stop!" And she threw her arm out, and I was like, "Where the fuck did you pick that up?" How and did then she she's learn like, that? So it turns out her teacher, when they're when they're doing like potty time, will sometimes play something on her phone to like oh. make sure the kids, st- I don't know, stay put or something. She goes, Miss Abby showed me. And I was like, oh, thank God. Okay. I was really nervous for a minute when she goes. So did you just channel Adina Menzel? Are oh, you my stop. Broadway muse? Like what and happened? I said, uh, it was hilarious. And then I said, Blaze, watch this. And I was like, do you want to build a snowman? And she just like whipped around and said, Anna, stop. 
And Blaze well, is no like, wonder she what doesn't want to no. watch it. Like it feels like school, probably. Oh, may- <laughs> maybe. I mean, she loves school though, so uh, maybe sh- should be. Maybe we should lean into that. But anyway, so uh, Anna, stop. You know that uh, feels like you're gonna accidentally, like Pavlovianly, <laughs> trigger her that every time she goes potty, she's gonna go Anna, stop. But like even as an adult, like she's just gonna be on the potty. Oh, the po- it- I was like, what does a potty have to do with it? Oh, because of it. Yeah, yeah. That's not my- Listen, this teacher is setting this up. Not me. Don't blame me. I'm not I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying that she's going to have an initial thought all the time when she goes. Like, I sort of feel like that was bound to happen. So, yeah, I guess of all things, it's not that bad. But that it could, be it's wor- a- it could be worse. That has to be so scary as a parent. Just like every time your kid opens their mouth and says something new, you're like, where the fuck did you get that from? You're like, oh, well, on? seriously, how am I supposed to keep up? And then Blaze and I have to update each other because we're like, oh, if she says this, I finally figured out it means this. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. d- don't worry. She's not summoning a spirit. She's referencing some episode, you know. <laughs> anyway, it, you never know. It's it's all uh, it's all very chaotic. So good to know. <laughs> I feel Just like now even up. when I'm on the potty, I'm going to go, Anna, stop. Anna, stop. I don't even know if that's how the song go or how they whatever. It's it made me laugh anyway. It's very precious. Um, where were we? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I that was I don't know bad. how we got there because <laughs> the last thing I said was someone grabbed a man and like dragged him to the light bulbs. You said, "Oh, he never came back." I don't know. I have no idea. I'm All so right. sorry. Your brain is also fascinating, Christine. That we should study. Is that it? For sure. <laughs> we should say, I don't think so. I think that's a dangerous game. So anyway, all that happened, like all the the construction crew was dealing with stuff because they did renovations in Judy Holiday's apartment after she died. So right. speaking of Judy Holiday's death, her death in the Dakota is part of a an ongoing theory that this entire building has a curse. Okay. Because okay. Many people who have walked through this building um, have either died very early or had some other horrible demise. Um, From the very beginning, the first person in this building was Edward Clark, and he didn't live long enough to even see the building get finished. Um, Judy Holliday, she she died early at 43. Marilyn Monroe, who got, like, Uh. rejected from living here, still had friends there and would visit often. And she did a That's photo shoot. Suck. She's like, I would have done something nicer with that mantelpiece, but whatever. I already know what I would have done. Yeah. She bad. apparently did a photo shoot at Judy Holiday's apartment. <gasps> so she's been in the building and she died at 36. Um, mm. Judy Garland, uh, Dorothy, well, yeah. lived there and she died at 47. John Lennon lived there. He died at 40. Oh, and- he lived there too. That's right. I did hear. Wow. Okay. This is getting scary. It's creepy. I mean, how old was he when he died? Sorry. 40. You just said it. So I don't like that it's in the 40s. That feels like when you're yeah. kind of like safe, right? Like, I mean, not safe, yeah. but it's like it should be a very healthy decade where you're an adult and you're you figured shit out. And, and then all of a sudden, bam, you know, it just, yeah. it's ugh. I feel like if you make it to 50 and you live there, you're like, oh, thank God. I'm you're like, oh, I, phew. I dodged a bullet. Yeah. Um, also just to add to all the people who died really early there after the exterior shots of Rosemary's baby was filmed there, the composer died from a head injury. The producer had kidney stones so bad that they gave him uh, pain that led to delusions and he started shouting they gave in the him ho- pain that he had so much pain from, he had a bout of kidney stones that was so painful. He ended up being delusional in the hospital later where oh. he started shouting in the hospital. Rosemary drop the knife. Ew. He just kept shouting that. Yeah. Then, uh, Rosemary's baby was directed by Roman Polanski. Uh-huh. And a year after the movie came out, his wife, Sharon Tate was one of the murder victims of the Manson family. Oh boy. Oh boy. So it's just, it feels a little dark, but also sure you does. could probably chalk it up. Well, not really though, but I could see someone trying to make the argument of like, oh, well, the lifestyles of the rich and the famous, maybe they, maybe they're all a little wild and they have a higher risk for early death. I don't know. I feel like you could probably come up with some sort of argument, but it's still weird. Yeah. It's still very weird. It is. I mean, I guess when it comes to drugs and stuff, but I feel like the, the deaths that aren't drug related, 
are still are are especially odd. Yeah, I, but hmm. also a lot of people moved in there, and like, I think Boris Karloff died in the Dakota. I think maybe there was just also a lot of death, so it led to a lot of ghosts, and maybe the ghosts bring the bad energy, and then the bad well, energy combined just... with that big nuclear power plant in the basement or whatever, and all the, the celebrities' club. creative spaces. That's you know. right, Maury mm-hmm. and all his on all his e- many easels and watercolors. I imagine this place is just. You know what? Maury's like a hundred years old, and he's is he still kicking? Uh, well, you know what? If he's not, then we've got some apologizing to do for the way we've <laughs> kind of just thrown his name around. Uh, yeah, he's eighty five. Wow, I actually did not know. Oh, he's married to Connie Chung. That's why mm-hmm. they both live there. Okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I forgot about that part of him. I, you know, I get him and Jerry Springer confused, which I know is blasphemous as a Cincinnatian, but the. Maury was always the one I watched. Actually, me too. Of all of them, it's Steve Wilkos. Steve, you were a Steve. Steve Wilkos. I was definitely a Maury. Um, Maury and Steve, but Jerry, I never cared for. Well, R.I.P. Anyway, may he rest in peace. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You want to keep going? <laughs> well, want to say okay. some shit about Regis Philbin this time? No. 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 Uh. The as I just mentioned briefly, the most famous spirit at this location is John Lennon, who lived here for five years with Yoko Ono, who was ninety one. I just looked up to see if she was still alive. She's ninety one. Mm-hmm. Um, elderly. Good so, for her. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just saying. Like, I feel like now we've talked about so many people who are forty and died, and then like ninety. Yes. Fuck yeah. Like she live that senior life. Go. She made it. Um. <laughs> So in 1975, John Lennon and Yoko Ono bought five apartments in this building. Oh, shit. Uh, They bought two on the seventh floor that I guess they built into one, I'm guessing, into one apartment. So so they had like 40 rooms. And then they bought three more for storage, for work, and for entertaining guests. And apparently this caused like a huge kerfuffle. I bet. It's like we only have 65 apartments. Now you've just bought. They're like Marilyn Monroe's not allowed to live here, but I guess you can store your shit in this apartment. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess when you're a beetle, you can do anything. But how did I mean, how could a a beetle do that? But Marilyn Monroe couldn't. I don't know. Um, Yeah. Anyway, but uh, so they ended up buying this out, buying out a bunch of apartments. I think after them, a rule got created that you could only buy one at a time. (laughs) So. Uh Aha. When they first moved in, the people who owned the apartment before them was Robert Ryan and his wife, Jessie, who died in the apartment, and her spirit is said to have haunted the Lennons. Uh, eventually, it got so wild that they called a psychic in to do a seance, oh, shit. and the ghost, Jessie Ryan, came through and told the Lennons she was leaving, but she w- or she would not leave. Sorry, the opposite. <laughs> she said, She's like, I- what did you just say? It's like, I'm not leaving, but don't worry, I won't bother you. But I am going to stick around. Which, <laughs> okay. I feel um, like you're bothering me by sticking around. Exactly. And I also feel like, couldn't you have just said, okay, bye, I'm leaving. And like not actually left and just pretended. I don't know. Yeah, couldn't you just read the thought. room that you're clearly not wanted here? We've hired a outside help to come in and talk to you no about offense, this. No offense. But love that you feel safe here. That's excellent and I'm so perfect happy for you. But it is not going to work for me. Um, not not today. John Lennon was apparently because because he was like open spiritually to all this stuff. He had no problem coexisting with the spirit. But okay. I, also, I feel like you'd have to be kind of open to a coexisting with a spirit if they just told you to their face. You're I mean, literally if they say I'm moving in and I, you can't get rid of me. Yeah, I guess. And you just spent probably a hundred million dollars here on five right. apartments. So right. we're both stuck. Yeah. Uh, fun fact about John Lennon living here. Uh, he claimed to see a UFO from one of the windows. Oh my God. Another fun fact is that apparently $30,000 is rumored to be buried under the floor of their apartment, but the board refuses to destroy the floor to find out. The floor Because board. it's original flooring. <laughs> okay. You uh, said the board. Never mind. Yeah, I know. I heard it. <laughs> okay. It's not funny. I thought it was funny in my head. It wasn't really. But um, do you... I mean... Hmm. I nope. wonder how that rumor started. Like, did somebody say they witnessed this happen i don't know 
I don't I even know, know if this. I think John Lennon even made it up because it sounds like it was from the previous residence. Oh, so oh, maybe that's why that ghost was fucking sticking around. <laughs> Just like my last story, where it's like, well, there's I'm attached to something under the floorboards. Uh, I have it's to always under the floorboards. Always, but anyway, we'll never know. I guess not for now, at least. Uh, another fun fact is that John Lennon not only was he being haunted by that woman. But he used to see another ghost all the time that he called the crying lady, who was Ooh. a woman with curly hair. And she would walk down the halls of the apartment building just crying. And she wore uh, outdated clothes that suggested she was from the late 1800s, early 1900s. One source says <sighs> this might have been a beautiful, wealthy tenant. And her, she got depressed and threw herself out of the window. That's one of the stories. The oh. other story is that she might be... Uh, Elise Vesley, who was one of the earlier property managers, and okay. apparently her son died nearby when she was still alive, and she never recovered. Aww. So they think maybe that's why she's crying. Oh. Um. Besides John Lennon, other people have also claimed to see her wandering the halls wearing an old gray gown. She cries. She quickly vanishes. And there was one article I read where a reporter actually got invited to a party at the Dakotas, and like said in advance like i'm gonna see this fucking crying lady i want to see this crying lady so apparently the reporter is hanging out in this at this party hears someone crying and looks around and nobody else is reacting <gasps> looks at the corner of the room and sees a woman sobbing in a dress <gasps> and you could see right through her but she still seemed real enough that it was weird to the reporter that nobody else was looking at her or oh, noticing her Oh, creepy and the woman walked out into the hall and the reporter followed the woman being like, I'm going to see how this goes. Runs out into the hall, sees nobody, but still hears a faint crying from down the hall. So the reporter runs down the hall is like, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to find you. Follows the sound of the crying down the hall and ends up at a dead end with an open window. <gasps> and the reporter sensed an intense sorrow and just knew in their gut that this was the window that she leapt from. Oh my God. That is quite a story. Last fun fact I have for you about John Lennon's time there is that while living in the Dakota, there's an interview that I just watched on YouTube where he reads a fan letter. He's in the Dakota. I'm pretty sure he's like lying in bed with Yoko Ono in a bed and doing this interview and reading a fan letter in his own home. Love, love that for him. Uh huh. Love that for him. <laughs> in the fan letter, he, the fan letter says, I was using a Ouija board and it predicted that you will be, that an assassination attempt will, will be made on you. Oh, geez. Well, is in, there a clip, clip of that somewhere? Yeah. It's like nine seconds long. It's, if that you look up so... John Lennon fan letter predicts death. Ooh, that's so up. eerie. Okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> I, I like when you cover your ears when you get nervous. I You're... do. I come. I know. I don't know why I do that. It makes everything louder in my ears. And your story. So I don't. It's like not helping me. I don't know why I do it. Well, so the eerieest part of it all is that he's reading that letter, reading, saying out loud a prediction of his death, in the Dakota, and in 1980. At the Dakota, Mark David Chapman, who's mad at John Lennon because he said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. In my world, they were. So he was kind of right. Mm -hmm. um, John Lennon was the victim of Mark David Chapman's assassination attempts, which, by the way, it was inspired by the book Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. He was carrying that book on him. Mm -hmm. Fun fact. And so... Uh, fucking loser he i guess hung around the dakota waiting for john lennon to leave the building when he first saw john lennon that day he got him to sign one of his records like, which is so yeah, eerie they, of like, like had an interaction Ugh. yeah and then let him go was like oh can you Ugh. sign my record and then john lennon left to go to a recording session and when he came back that night chapman shot him five times four hit him in the back and this is a quote Chapman remained at the scene reading The Catcher in the Rye until he was arrested. Yeah. I literally sat on the curb and was like, anyway, chapter seven. 
how how it's like nothing more premeditated than like oh before i kill him i should get him to sign one last thing that i can have for the rest of time like you know you're going to jail so like why do you have to even get that thing signed unless you want like a memento of the day yuck yeah god who knows i mean clearly he was not you know in his right mind so it's a it's just sad and like uh, yeah i remember um recently hearing like the full story of his assassination um it was probably in that same episode to be honest whatever that was it might have been lore but um uh, is it true i i heard that yoko ono had like a she was like playing the piano or something oh yeah i have that oh you do okay sorry oh when he was being shot or i could be wrong i don't know Oh, I feel like I'm misremembering. I thought she had kind of a psychic vision when he was killed. Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe I have half the information and you have half the information. Oh, that would be a fun little puzzle. Um, What I have is that ever since he died at the Dakota, or I saw one source that said he died at the hospital or he was dead on arrival, but most people say that he died on the steps of the Dakota. Um, So, I mean, he got shot four times pretty point I heard, blank so i'm pretty um, sure he like tried to get to the stairs too which is yeah like he really like took a few steps and collapsed oh boy and oh boy. i think yoko ono was with him because she left and came that's, back from the recording session with him that's true yeah i do believe she was with him i think there's some story i read where like either she had a vision or there was some bizarre occurrence that happened Hmm. I don't know with her and him when he passed like a or maybe he, maybe his ghost came to her or something like that I feel like maybe that was it so what I have is that n- a- ever since he died now people will see his ghost outside by the archway where he was shot sometimes they see Oof. an eerie glow by the building sometimes they see like a body of energy where he died people have seen his apparition walking by they've seen it staring out uh, out of the windows someone says that they saw him flashing the peace sign Someone says that uh, they saw him walking from the Dakota to Central Park. And then that would one trip me up so. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that would trip me up so bad because you, you'd be like, I just saw John Lennon. But then you're like, what if someone was just prank? Like, what if someone's wandering around dressed as John Lennon? And like, well, that's what I. So the next thing I was going to say is that one hot dog vendor, he <laughs> swears that he heard the ghost singing. Give peace a chance. You don't think people go to that site every day exactly. and fucking play his phone. His that's song what on the I phone. W- feel like I would doubt myself if I actually saw John Lennon. I'd be like, that's just an impersonator. Yeah, it's someone dress dressing the part, the, the part or something. Yeah. Um, what I think you're talking about is that even in the Dakota, people have seen his ghost mm. in the apartment building, including Yoko Ono, who said that uh-huh. she saw John Lennon's ghost in their apartment playing their piano. And he looked at her and said, don't be afraid. I'm still with you. Whoa. And uh, a lot of sites were saying like, since Yoko Ono saw him, we have to trust that it's real. And I'm like, I would argue that like the spouse, the bereaved spouse is, or the grieving spouse is probably the last one we should probably trust right off the bat. But everyone thought like, because Yoko Ono saw him, it's gotta be real. And I'm like, okay. But also like if someone I love died, I would be playing tricks with my head. Nonst- I mean, it could be real, I, but I mean, it was, yeah, it, it, it's an odd argument to be like, well, she couldn't be wrong about that. Yeah, it's like just, <laughs> just because she argument. was the closest to him. But it's like, I would argue that because she's the closest to him, her brain is like telling her a million different ways that he's still in the house, you know? Right, right, right. It could be just a trick of the mind. Yeah. But apparently because she saw him, everyone's like, every other ghost story must be true. For what so, it's worth, I believe that she saw him. But, you know. And I believe that the hot dog vendor heard him sing. So. You know what? Me too fucking justice for that hot dog vendor why don't they say you forget forget yoko oh no if that hot dog vendor saw it then we know it's true (laughs) that's what i always say um i have one last thing to add to my notes and then it will be your turn but i it was too good to not tell um there was a source that i found that said the original owner of the dakota edward clark who mr toupee man (laughs) yeah um, oh i I won't soon forget (laughs) well since the building was 
made in the 1880s. It was kind of around uh, the spiritualism time, and apparently uh-huh. Edward Clark liked to hold seances. No, on his fucking silver floors. On his silver floor. Imagine that. That's so creepy. It probably like holds all the energy in it. There's got to be something metaphysical with that. I don't know what Wait it is. Wait a minute. But... I think you're right. Maybe it is. Maybe it's like silver vampires. I don't know. Just a thought. Maybe it is maybe interesting believe... that it's called the Dracula and it has silver. F- Wait, isn't just... silver werewolves? Hmm. No, silver cross. Oh, I was thinking silver bullet. Silver also is that. apparently <laughs> and silver okay, maybe bolts the silver in was... Frankenstein's neck. Maybe that's what they were trying to trying to do is like prevent I don't know ethereal beings from entering the space while he did his seance, like bad ones, you know, while he did his seance. If you're a witch um, in 2024, can you please tell me what silver floors must be doing? Because it's got to do something. Um, they must be doing something. Well, so I wanted to say Edward Clark likes to hold seances here. And I don't know if they did this in the spirit of that or they just happen. It happens to be a fun fact that that works here. But there's there was a composer who used to live here named Leonard Bernstein. He had Mm. a three bedroom apartment that eventually sold to a family called the Milsteins for twenty and a half million dollars. By the way, Jesus Christ. You're doing it wrong, rich people. Like, at some point, you're so rich, things you start doing, like, not rich things. Like, you just, like, lose your, yeah. You're spending over $20 million on a three bedroom apartment. You're fucking wrong. That's not how it works. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so Leonard Bernstein lived there. The Milsteins bought it. And uh, this is a a headline from New York Times called Young Socialites Conjure the Ghost of Leonard Bernstein at the Dakota. (gasps) <gasps> and apparently these like millennial or Gen Z rich kids. Wait, this it, is recent? I think it's pretty recent. Hold on, let me t- let me let me see what year it was. I think it was pretty recent. It was giving gossip girl. So uh 2017. So six years ago. Seven Damn. years ago. Damn. For some reason when you first said it, I thought it was like from the 1940s, like so young socialites. Oh, like, that'd be have fun. Have a little seance, but that'd be fun. This is like a TikTok era thing. Well, not quite. This is but like almost a TikTok era thing. If it was seven years ago, then they're millennials. They're our age. They're yeah. So it would to... be like an Instagram thing. <laughs> an Instagram thing, but it's interesting. So I guess when the Milsteins bought it out from the Bernsteins, the wow. Milstein millennial kids who lived in that house were like, "Well, he lived there." He lived no here before they don't us. Allow kids in this place, they're just fucking having bringing back the dead and trick or treating. I don't know if they knew about Edward Clark also holding seances here, and so they're like, "Well, if the original founder mm. of this place did it, he would be okay with us doing it." Or if right. it was just a separate thing of like, "Oh, wouldn't it be fun if we like We're used a Ouija teenagers. board and conjured yeah. our <laughs> or the previous tenant?" I mean, we've done it, but anyway. So, so the New York Times fashion section wrote a piece on this and it really is the most gossip girl thing i've ever heard in my life because since it's the new york times fashion section and they're talking about the up-and-coming social elite Uh it's almost like the spooky part of this doesn't even fucking count um wow so here's here's clips from the article so this is um the the milstein kids who did this their I names are wait. Larry and Toby. They're now probably 29 and 31. So they're our age. Wow. And the Milsteins are a family that's estimated back in 2015. They were estimated to be worth like $3 billion. Cool, cool, cool. So just to give you an idea of where these people are. And they, I guess, wanted to host a seance in their parents' room. And the New York Times went, we're going to write about it. So. Uh, so they attended basically like the reporter attended this the reporter seance? i think it, yes the reporter attended oh i thought it was just like a really casual like let's get out of ouija board but it was like oh no this is a soiree and we're wearing our finery they're okay. estimated three billion dollars i don't think they're I... in their walmart sweatpants doing a ouija board no they're okay fa- fair i i guess i just didn't know it was a premeditated ouija board i thought maybe like oh we found mama's uh tortoise shell Galapagonian tortoise shell Ouija board. We should play. No, they like planned this out in advance. Um, yeah. Let me just read this quote. Okay. <laughs> 
young socialites conjure the ghost of Leonard Bernstein at the Dakota. This is uh, a series of quotes that I've jumbled into one for, all from the same piece. Great. Miss Milstein for the seance wore a pink and gray striped halter dress and embroidered lace up sandal booties, both by Fendi. Mr. Milstein, who graduated from Yale in May, paired a green Fendi blazer with a club Monaco top, rag and bone trousers and Gucci fur lined leather slippers personalized with tiger appliques. The family fortune can be traced to Morris Milstein, who founded the Circle Floor Company in 1919. Family, f family lore has it that he ran multiple businesses with different names using a single set of stationery printed Office of the Undersigned. Which, are you fucking kidding me? That's so badass. That then, is badass. I'm loving this. To set the seance mood, I can you imagine? Okay, okay, I'm just gonna read it. To set what, the seance how much mood. Were the how much were the candles? Like, it was like one candle... Like to set grand. the seance mood, a grapefruit and cucumber taka <laughs> candle, taka toka. I don't even. I'm not that rich. I don't know. Uh, candle scented the air. Just, while while we're correcting, uh, applique. I think is what you meant. To applique. Say. Okay. Cool. See, I I am not worth three billion dollars. Um. Okay. No, don't uh, be so hard on yourself. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. No. Put no, your not chin you, up, my my dear M. <laughs> uh. To, I'm the person who has Walmart sweatpants and uses and has a dirty Ouija board. That's what I've got. So, well, to you set have the, the seance, one I, I drew for you on the back of a poster with a sharpie. So I don't know. To set the seance mood, a grapefruit and cucumber candle scented the air as a candelabrum flickered dramatically on the piano. Crystal mm. ice buckets chilled mini champagne splits alongside a bottle of Jack Daniels and an arrangement of pastel macarons. The Shut mood the was simultaneous. The mood was simultaneously somber and expectantly gay, like that of a family dressed for the reading of a will in which they're expecting good news. You can understand why I would have thought this was in like the 1960s or something, right? Like the way they're and writing And also about a it. satire, yes. And also satirical. It really does feel outrageous. <laughs> Wait for this. They oh. assembled around the piano as if it were a coffin. And Mr. Milstein distributed pages printed with the lyrics of songs associated with the Dakota's departed talents. The group touched glasses and accompanied by Mr. Pegler on piano began a medley that included Mr. Bernstein's Maria from West Side Story, Imagine by John Lennon, and playing along with the evening's theme, Taylor Swift's I Don't Want to Live Forever, recently popularized <laughs> by Zayn Malik. In Ed... <laughs> In execution, it was more Beyonce than Seance. Wow, for, for 20 minutes, the only spirits present appeared to be the Jack Daniels. But as the Steinway <laughs> tinkled and voices filled the room, vibrations rose from deep beneath the earth like a musical giant shifting in its grave. Or perhaps it was just the A train. Are you kidding me? <laughs> anyway, that's the Dakota. Whoever that is. I hope they run Vogue now. That, I mean, I can't, it literally feels like something Serena Vanderwoodson and Blair Waldorf would have, like, written up on Gossip Girl. It's honestly one of the funniest things I've ever heard. And I feel like um, this is a sign. First of all, it also sounds like something I've been watching, re-watching Schitt's Creek, which you can probably tell in some of the things I've said today. But uh, it just gives such, like, Schitt's Creek vibes, like, so so yes so very more rose right like it's just like what are you even doing but i kind of love it but also it makes me wonder first of all are the richies coming for our spooky stuff like go away second of all are seances in again uh i think so i mean this was clearly what did you say seven fucking years ago wow okay seven years ago but like maybe there's a sign here that the like oh the elite are bringing back seances like how the back in the spiritualism days you know like maybe yeah, this but you is... know what you know oh. in all that writing not a single fucking note on what happened at the seance except yeah, what the candles yeah. smelled like so i feel like mm. they and also by the way wrong. well they're doing it wrong because i feel like anyone i don't even know witchcraft well enough to tell you what they should have done but i know it well enough to know that the cucumber grapefruit candle is not the candle you light for a seance okay so, but however i will argue with that because i've read in my witchy books that right. it does not matter what type of candle because you don't want to get hung up in the details i mean they are hung up in the details so there is that but it, hmm. you know it's all about the intention 
So it could be. What was their intention? I don't think a seance was it at the end of the day. I think it was to get a, <laughs> a Fendi feature. It sounds almost like a promo for like Fendi, if Fendi ever needed a promo. I don't know. It's very weirdly like it feels sponsored. It feels like yeah. spawn con. You know? And then all it's of a like, sudden I fall into like what are the politics of like rich people and the newspaper? Because like if you reached out to Fendi and said – my family's worth three billion dollars. They're going to do a piece on us in the fashion yeah. section. If you send me something from Fendi, I will make sure it's mentioned in the. Or if you know, you then all of a sudden like it all feels like you, ten million dollars. I'll wear this Fendi dress. <laughs> yeah, and they'll make a sent. They'll say it'll say a sentence about I'm sure it. Sure, the there's so. This is why I love shows like Succession because it's like I, I don't even know if it's real or what, but just watching people with that amount of money, it's like aliens. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know what to do with it. I would, like, were you just wearing Walmart sweatpants before Fendi sent you a blazer to wear for the the piece? Oh, were you wearing them ironically? Because that's kind of fucked up, oh. you know? It's mm-hmm. like, hmm, hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, anyway uh, I thought that was just about the best seance I never want to go to. And because <laughs> they were taking one look at me and been like, out you go. Uh, um, bye-bye. <laughs> But apparently people like that are having seances. So you're right. I think uh, people like us should be I feel like they would seances. have looked at us and been like, ghosts. Yeah. You know, they've been like, demonic <laughs> entities. Get the them out The poor. Like something it's like. so dirty. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the boat. Um, go back to your boat. <laughs> go back to the Dakota boat. Okay. So anyway, that is the Dakota. Um, that was a really good one. I really enjoyed that story. Thank you for sharing. It felt like it had a million stories within a story, you know? Sure did. A lot of fun facts. I love a fun fact. Um, I think you did an excellent job. Uh, Also, I meant to mention this earlier, but like, what is it with people saying, I am going to this place and I'm going to see a ghost, this specific ghost, and then it happens? Couldn't be me. I've tried. Should we try? Should we test it? I'm nervous. Did I? I did mention on the show the the little when i asked for an heirloom yes yes we talked about uh, it yes on the show okay yep. yeah uh, that was the first time that i think i had been i actually got an answer manifested sort of like someone spoke. said you just have to ask for it really specifically and it will happen and i was like that has literally never happened for me and it's the only time it's worked so i feel like it's very the secret you know um you but know, I do believe we kind of create our own reality. So in a way, I'm like, I mean, I guess if you try hard enough. So Kylie yeah. Jenner, there was a, I don't remember which year it was, but I think it was 2020, 2019. No, maybe someone else weigh in. But Kylie Jenner, at the turn of a new year, she was turn of reported. The she was re- <laughs> uh, filmed saying, this is going to be the year of knowing things and realizing things. This is the year of realizing things. And maybe this is the year of asking things. Like just okay. saying, hey, I'm asking for it. And if you don't deliver, there is not much I can do. But I'm asking. So I love that. M, that energy. Let's ask for things. And if they don't, what's the worst that happens? They don't come to us, you know? Yeah. And then after asking for things, maybe it is also another year of realizing things after we've asked for it. I feel like we've realized enough and I'm kind of over it. That's what a lot of people were saying, like through COVID and Trump and everything. Yes. People would take that meme of Kylie and they were like, I'm done realizing I'm things. I'm done like, realizing. I don't, want, yeah. I don't want to realize like anymore. A, a modern day prophet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, tell Kris Jenner. I'm sure she will use that in some. Oh, I'm sure she's already created, like, I don't know, a <laughs> trademark that. So I can't say it anymore. Um, okay. Let's get to my story, shall we? Mm-hmm. This is the story of the murder of Mia Zapata. Okay. Obligatory pause to see if you know it. Always. I think out of however many episodes we've done, maybe 10. I've okay. had a reaction. So, But those 10, they it's were a fun important. time. It was, <laughs> those are special. <laughs> they are very significant, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, just as a heads up, uh, there are a number of sources here, but uh, one that I found particularly helpful was an episode of a show called Dead of Night, which is like a, you know, classic Discovery Plus situation. Um, And the episode is called Sound of Silence, and I watched it on Amazon Prime. Cool. So it was cool. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. Mia was born in Chicago in August of 1965 to parents Richard and Donna Zapata. And when she was a young child, her family moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where she grew up in a suburb, attended a college prep high school. Um, Her parents, though, worked in the media and they made quite a bit of money. Uh, And so Mia lived a pretty comfortable life, like I want to say like traditional Midwest vibes, but also her parents had quite a bit of money. Um, So, you know, she she had a what was described as a smart polished and sophisticated family okay so keep that in mind. like yeah. dakota quality dakota quality in louisville kentucky mm. you know what i mean I, fun I mix do. yeah so mia and her friends however were described as sophisticated in a less traditional sense which also sounds like the meanest thing you could say in like 1895 or something dakota like boat quality <laughs> precisely So basically what that meant is that Mia was creative, intelligent, musically gifted, like, you know, a little weird, a little different, like colored her hair, you know, so had polish and sophistication and money, but was a little bit different than her kind of traditional parents and siblings. So because of her musical abilities, um, she ended up going to school at Antioch College, which is up here in Ohio, Yellow Springs, Ohio, very small liberal arts school, shout out. And while there, she formed a band, and this would have been 1986. So her bandmates were Joe Spleen, Steve Moriarty, and Matt Dresner. Joe Spleen was meant to be in a fucking band. (laughs) Joe Spleen sounds like the fakest name from a sitcom Joe <laughs> Joe <Yeah. laughs> Spleen sounds like there was a a band called Jackal that my dad really liked, and uh-huh. uh, they had a song called The Lumberjack. And at, at the whole song, instead of like a guitar, someone's just revving a chainsaw, and oh that that feels like something Joe <laughs> Spleen is does. Joe Spleen level, yeah, yeah, absolutely, it does in the garage, like yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Uh, he's like, how about this guy? He revs the lawnmower, and they're like, not quite the so same. I call not this one the, the lumberjack. <laughs> <laughs> like spleen. We t- what did we tell you? It's like you know they call you him knew- spleeny. I was gonna say you knew they call him spleen. Like there's no way they called him Joe. Okay, that. But no Joe way. spleen, like on a poster, is like that's killer. That's that's amazing. the most like like who's the guy with the jean jacket from Stranger Things? Like the the rocker. You know he's obsessed with Joe spleen. It's got, yeah, the Joe Spleen, um, the, what do you call it when you do, when you st- hand stamp like a art? Turkey? <laughs> it's like Thanksgiving it's turkey? Like... <laughs> it's just a turkey who says Joe Spleen. <laughs> it's just his preschool artwork you, that they sent imagine, home. Can you imagine if we had a, a band poster, like a metal band, it's just a little turkey handprint and it okay, says Joe realize, Spleen. Like, you realize Xenon is also just like a hand turkey, <laughs> but just green, right? Like you realize she's that, just right? a turkey at the end of the day, aren't we all? She is. She is a big old turkey. Anyway, I don't remember what we were talking about, so let's get back to this. Uh, okay. The band. Uh, so the band. She has Joe Spleen, et cetera, et al. So Matt first heard Mia sing at a college open mic night, and he said, "I was transfixed and overcome. I cried. He, like that's how much her voice." resonated with him he cried wow he said it was raw honest to the bone and from the heart so you're gonna really love this this is the name of the band and it sounds like something you call me as like a fun little pet name okay they called themselves sniveling little rat-faced gits (laughs) (laughs) now Um, this is full credit a monty python reference but still very funny Okay, so it was rat. What was it? Sniveling little rat-faced gits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. So, yeah, it sounds great. And it I love it even more. Um, so I, I think I already said this, but it is a Monty Python reference. But I think I love it even more because ultimately the band name officially became The Gits. Not the sniveling rats, but yeah, I understand. No. The gits. The gits does sound cooler. But but, but I like the gits because you're like, you don't really know what it is. And then when you find the backstory, it's like a really fun little, you know. Yeah, that's fun. Lore what is a it. git? Uh, I assume it's just like a little, a brat? I don't know. Like a git out of here? 
maybe that's kind of when, when I first heard the gits, uh, an unpleasant or contemptible person. Uh, <sighs> is here you. it is. A, M is a mean old git. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you. So they shortened it to the Gits, which I love. Uh, And Mia, like I said, was a very musical person. She'd grown up deeply passionate about music, learning to play guitar, piano at a very early age. She and her siblings would sing together and she kept journals where she would write down thoughts, lyrics, poetry. Uh, She was especially inspired by blues, jazz and R&B. And she found influence in work by singers like Billie Holiday, Bessie Smith, you know, very old school traditional artists. But meanwhile, the Gits were a punk rock band and they were trying to get in on this 80s, 90s grunge scene that was so big. (laughs) So Joe played the drums, Andrew was on guitar, Matt played bass, and Mia was the obviously singer and lyricist. And she drew on some of her earliest inspirations for their songs. They had a sort of bluesy tone, which was like an homage to her her interest in the blues. Um, And it was also a new twist on punk rock like punk rock usually didn't have kind of a a traditional blues you know uh bent to it did you ever listen to like those um uh i think they were like charity albums uh called like punk goes crunk and pop goes rock oh my gosh punk goes crunk was crazy there was uh it was like a bunch of like warp tour bands at the time. They would all get together and like oh. do a song, but it was like they would do a Change cover genre. Of, of a different genre. And there oh, was I like I love a, that. I, I the one I listened to was Punk Goes Crunk, but I think there was like Pop Punk Goes, goes Pop Goes Rock or Rock Goes Pop. But it was it was always like a, a genre shift. And uh, I, I guess the, love that the CD would they'd get like the top twenty. Warp tour artists to cover a different song and the whole CD the proceeds went to something. I mean, so I yesterday saw a TikTok where a person was singing the most beautiful acoustic cover of Lil Wayne and I was like <laughs> this is like this is what I'm talking about. I love this energy, this creative mishmash swapping swapping the genres, you know? I love there's, it. I love there's it. There's one I still listen to um that it was by do you remember the main Mm-hmm. It's like a of band. Course. They did. Um, oh, I want to love you. Uh, oh and they did a. It was punk goes crunk. But the main I want to love you is still something I listen Wait, to by in my Akon? car all the time. Yeah. Oh, I think so. see now that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I thought you meant it was the name of a main song, and I was like, I don't know the names of the songs. Oh but no, they the sang... main did. I want to love you by Akon, and it's to that until this day, it's perfect. like one of my top listen to songs oh i'm gonna pull that i'm gonna listen to that later too i love that i love it oh akon so blues something goes blues goes rock is what this okay. is <laughs> right right, right. Punk, punk goes kerplunk i don't know i'm i'm not i'm not, I'm not I, clearly i'm new to this whole thing okay um so basically they had this bluesy tone and so I tell you that to say their punk rock, even though there were so many of these 80s and 90s kind of grunge bands, there stood out because they had this kind of different element to it. And uh, wouldn't you know it, Mia and the band in 1989 thought, where are we going to go to try and really make it in the grunge world? Where's that, M? Hollywood. <laughs> Seattle, Washington. Oh, OK. That makes sense. That. That is where the whole grunge scene was, you know, the biggest. So they moved there in 1989 to Seattle, just a few years before grunge, the grunge wave, like hit the city with full force. And me and her friends were newcomers to what was becoming like this burgeoning scene. If they wanted to be part of the community, they had to uh, make a space for themselves. So they moved from Ohio to Seattle. They moved into this like rundown property, which they fondly dubbed the Rat House. The, and uh, you just got to love them. You got to love, love them. them. I feel like I'd be friends with all of them. Oh, for sure. We'd be so <laughs> we'd be having. Meanwhile, these socialites are having seances at the Dakota and we're like in the Rat House having a real <laughs> seance. <laughs> and we'd be like, why don't they invite us anywhere? I don't get yeah. it. Why don't they want us well, at their seance? How come Fendi never sends me a tasteful tennis tennis outfit yeah (laughs) i don't understand so the gits were quickly welcomed into the grunge scene uh and one journalist named adam 
Tepidellen said, they were very involved in the music scene. They took care of the scene and took care of each other. They put out their own records. They put out records by each other's bands. Just Aww. a very supportive, I know, I love it. Very supportive grunge scene. Um, a couple other bands uh, that were kind of in their same circles were DC Beggars and Seven Year Bitch. That's another thing you call me sometimes. <laughs> You're the DC beggar, and I'm the seven-year bitch. <laughs> oh, and, like, man. These must be bands. I don't know them, but I'm also not, like, cool. Like, I don't know if you know these bands or anything. I've I, never I heard of seven-year bitch, but they're about to be, like, my Spotify, like, wrapped at the end <laughs> is going to be, like, Joe Spleen and seven-year bitch <laughs> and the rats. And Akon. And Akon. <laughs> and <Acon. laughs> And that one Akon song. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So, I mean, they knew what they were doing. Like, the, you could just tell these were fun folks. Um, so their house, the rat house, uh, as it will always be known in my heart, was a social spot for parties and support. It was kind of like a meeting house, you know, where people would meet and party and, and just get together. If they so, had texting back then, what year was this? Yeah. Well, it was 19, early 90s, so not quite yet. Maybe yeah. a pager. You know, if they had texting, it would be like, meet me at the rat house. Meet me. At, or like, <laughs> they, they'd have <laughs> like a, a on the Facebook pager, it would be like, uh, MM at RH. And be like, yeah. what does it mean? <laughs> oh, my pagers. My beeper says I have to get to the rat house. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Or it'll just say like seven and you'll know like seven year bitch is around. You oh. Know? I immediately would understand that one. Yeah. For then sure. you would go. Yeah. Then you'd be there. So uh, Elizabeth Davis Simpson, speaking of seven year bitch, uh, was part of that band. And she said that Mia would often pop into their rehearsals just to like give them a thumbs up and say, you're doing great. <laughs> so she's All right. just, I know. I love it. She's just a very supportive, very um, friendly and outgoing person. Some people, however, described her as more stoic with like a very uh, closely guarded private side um even the people closest to her felt like she had some darker parts of herself that she didn't like you know give up as willingly but they also thought of her as very kind with an extremely great sense of humor um she was obviously very serious about music but wasn't afraid to laugh at herself for example when she was little her family called her chicken legs because she was double jointed and kind of had like a wobbly oh walk God. So they called her chicken legs. And so as an adult, she got a chicken tattooed on her leg. Oh, that's fun. Isn't that cute? Yeah. I just love It's kind of like when I you call me tarantula it. legs and one day I'll have a tarantula on my. One day you'll wake up and I will have placed a tarantula on your leg. It'll be great. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, the next move is mine, I guess, after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy okay so she and her bandmates uh dressed up as court jesters for one of their filmed performances they, she was just a a goofy fun person but she was also sentimental she would collect keepsakes um like she kept the dress that she wore to her sister's wedding even though like she was not kind of a frilly dress type girl mm -hmm. She it was so important to her that she had worn it in her sister's wedding that she kept it, which I think is very sweet. Mia was also self-assured and determined to pursue what she wanted, what she believed in. Um, she her aesthetic basically was the polar opposite of the kind of rich, uh, wealthy, private, privately schooled household she grew up in. But her family was still very supportive of her, which is, you know, kind of unheard nice. of. So I love that. She had dyed hair. She wore thrifted clothes. Um, she kind of decided to forego wealth. And these are things that uh, her family were like very proud of her for, you know, even though they didn't totally fall in the same camp. She still she sounds like that cousin at Thanksgiving that you just want so badly to like you. And yes like, oh and she yeah just that won't. everybody likes or like yeah, maybe she does like, maybe she like hasn't like she a, probably like a, does a, a That's distant the understanding and appreciation for you but it's not enough for you when you need the constant everyone's just validation. kind of like in their sunlight yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like i just want you to take me on your just next adventure you get me out of this me. town i'll just leave my open journal out and be like oh did you um <laughs> see that song i was writing <laughs> it was called dirty little rat or something it's so called um, dirty, it's called i'm a dirty i'm a thirsty little rat and i live in a 
I live in the 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 walls of the Dakota. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the okay. ship, but the ship, not the building. Okay. <laughs> it's a Fall Out Boy song. That's why there's so many words. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back to this bullshit. Okay, so. Her family was very supportive of her, even though, you know, she kind of eschewed the things that they had raised her with. Uh, Her father even claimed that he had worked to teach Mia as a young girl to understand that people from different communities and life experiences were just as valuable and just as important. I know. And he said of Mia and her peers, their road is not easy. Society. Imagine someone's dad like this should be if you have, um, you know, any sort of issues with parental approval everybody out there maybe listen close your eyes listen to this and pretend like this is your dad talking okay Mm. so this guy said of his daughter mia and her peers in seattle their road is not easy society in general is quick to judge young people on appearance first and quality of character second mia was different she never judged anybody and he he just supported her all the way th- all the way through which makes of course the story just that much sadder so mm-hmm. the gits for what it's worth attracted a loyal local following uh even though they were kind of just doing their own thing not trying to pursue fame or anything like that they did get a local following leading up to their 1992 debut album called frenching the bully <laughs> Which is just, I literally just want to marry them. I have a cru- they, they should be invited into the Dakota. That's how creative they are. Like get them <laughs> they, in there. They like they all have like bisexual energy. Like and oh, like sure. it's like they're all just way too fucking cool. I could never touch them with a ten foot pole because they wouldn't even being let in the me. room. Like you would want to like melt into the wall. You'd be like, I don't want to even I, step foot on this. I just want to watch them work. I just want to work. I just want to be in their glow. Like, I just, I just I don't need... wish making the band was around to film Ugh. it so I could see what's happening behind the scenes. <laughs> this is, I mean, every, it just, it also feels like a very, like, a maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally well oiled system where it just seems like their whole thing, like, they just naturally all work so well together. It's and so it's wholesome. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not competitive. You're just, it's, they're all it's rooting more... for each other. Which I feel like is kind of something you hear, at least. I mean, I'm not in... I know this is going to be shocking. I'm wearing a literal pink Fall Out Boy t-shirt right now. But uh, I'm not in on the punks, like the real like underground punk scene, right? But I have friends who are or who have been. And they're like, oh, it's just all about like you host a show at, in your, at your place and we'll host yours next. You know, it's a lot of like well, I feel building like... each other up, supporting each other, that kind of thing. I, again, I am not the... Uh the usual (laughs) spokesperson for punk world but i feel like anything i have ever learned about punk or like the the culture of it is like Mm -hmm. it's just warm and kind and it's almost like they seem scary at first if you don't understand them just because like the aesthetics of it all but like yeah i i've never met someone who was in punk who wasn't just who was just lovely and kind and just right I mean, I'm sure there are, okay? Like, I imagine there are definitely punk rockers who are assholes. Like, don't get me wrong. But I think you're right that, like, from what I've seen as well, the people I know in those circles are like, no, we all just, like, cheerlead each other on. Yeah, the stereotype I've built in my head of them is that it's just, like, kind of like how how every, um, and I'm sure there's assholes who are the exception, of course, but same with, like, growing up and, like, in our childhood hearing like occult and satanic and all oh, this sa- stuff and like it's Satan- so scary yeah, satanists right and it's right, like right. i've never met a satanist who i didn't want to hang out with like they just all seem right. so lovely it wasn't or, like, like very empathetic the- and yeah yeah it's exactly like, it- it's like the 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 big headline of it seems scary but then when you meet them it's like oh these are actually the loveliest people i've ever met and so i think the cutest part like is punk like falls the- into that I agree. And I think the cutest part is like her dad is like, yeah, hell yeah. You know, yeah. don't judge them. They're great people and they have such great character. And I'm like, wow, most people, but many people's parents would just immediately close that door and be like, forget it. You've crossed a line, you know, but I just, I love how um, much support and love she had in her life mm-hmm. um, all the way back in Kentucky. I just love it. <laughs> so anyway, they, release their debut album frenching the bully our favorite and uh, <laughs> just so good it's giving a mortal um, portal but not douchebag but like but right but like on the good side uh, yeah. on 
the flip, the quite opposite of that. Yeah. So Mia had a presence on stage that was, people described it as electric. Her voice was described, which my heart, as a mashup of singers such as Bessie Smith, Janis Joplin, just a very, I don't even know the right way to put it, but like a very um, earthy sound Mm. almost. I mean, remember that guy said, one of her bandmates said the first time he heard her sing, he started crying. Yeah. Um, She just apparently had a really incredible voice. And the band as a whole was blowing people away with their sound um people described (laughs) i mean maybe there were drugs involved here but people described their live performances as quote transcendent so (laughs) i know i'm like either way it sounds something right they were either (laughs) handing out the correct uh dose of ecstasy or (laughs) and or they were putting on an incredible show you know something they were doing was working wonders and people in town were loving it so uh, there was this guy named Tim Som of Al- Atlantic Records, and when he talked about this whole era of the Gits, uh, he said, quote, We were used to seeing dynamic, charismatic punk rock performers in front of people. Rarely did they have voices as powerful or as rooted in rock and blues tradition as Mia. She was just this melodic, powerful foghorn at the center of the tsunami that was the Gits. Holy shit. Yeah, so they were making waves, so to speak. And Mia herself, um, fun fact, was obviously not a white male in a very white male dominated scene. She was actually identified as a Latina woman. And so this also kind of helped her pave the way for other women in her community to follow suit and start making music and join bands. It was like she, I don't know, led the way, led the way for, for women of color to kind of participate in in this men dominated scene so by the summer of 1993 the band had made a strong name for itself and its newest singles were getting positive reviews from fans and even from music critics who were really into their sound a lot of people expected them to make it quote unquote and like you sort of said earlier you know go to hollywood like make it big get signed Mm -hmm. by a label they drove down to L.A. for another band's show, but while they were there, they met with Tim Som, who I just quoted earlier. Um, and at that point, he was the A&R representative, which stands for Artists and Repertoire, the oh. A&R representative for Atlantic Records. So he is a big wig or was at the time. He later said, once I became aware of the Gits and I saw them perform, it was a no brainer for me. So Atlantic Records has eyed these folks Hmm. the gits were signed but not even a week later everything came crashing down in the worst way a week later a week less than a week yeah yeah so around midnight on july 7th 1993 mia was at comet tavern in seattle's capitol hill neighborhood drinking with friends And she admitted she was feeling down about her ex-boyfriend, Robert Jenkins, because he had started seeing a new girl and she felt insecure and just bummed out about it. So her friends, meaning well, suggested she go talk to him. And, you know, first she said, no, I don't think so. But after a few drinks, she agreed. She said, I'm just going to pop in. Just see what it's about. See, just check in. See, I mean, that's something I would fucking do. Drink like, in the scene. Drink in the scene. Drink in some drinks. Drink in the scene. See what's happening. Uh, so she agreed. She said, you know what? Yeah, I'll go talk to him. So according to Rolling Stone, because they do a pretty full coverage of this whole story, Mia reportedly left the bar around midnight to look for Robert Jenkins, her ex, at a rehearsal space about one block away from the bar. And when she arrived, he wasn't there. So instead, she went to a friend's apartment in the same building, right? Okay. So she she goes down the street. It's like a block away from the bar. She pops into the recording space, doesn't see her ex, Robert. So her friend lives in the same building. So she goes there instead. She stays at this friend's apartment until about 2 a.m. And that would be the last time she was ever seen alive. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's not known to us what Zapata did for the next 80 minutes. Uh, She may have gone to a taxi stand. She may have 
continued looking for her ex, Robert Jenkins. But what we do know is that around 3.20 a.m., a sex worker walking in the central area almost two miles from the comet noticed Mia Zapata's body lying on a deserted street. Of course, authorities were called. First responders attempted to revive her, but it was too late. And horribly, investigators determined that Mia had first been raped and then strangled to death with the hoodie cords of her own Gitz <gasps> sweatshirt. I didn't even know you could do that. Isn't that horrific? By her own hoodie like, strings. Yeah, yeah. By oh her my own God. hoodie strings. I literally never even thought that was a possible way. Yeah. That totally makes yeah. sense, though. I mean, I mean, it does, unfortunately, but... Ugh. that's a very intentional way to go that wasn't an accident it feels very it feels very especially because it was her band shirt right you know mm. it's just yeah ugh. it also it, it but also just feels like it was like a very personal or like intimate way to to that's a very up close and personal way to it kill sure somebody. it sure does yes so Mia didn't show up for rehearsal the next day, obviously, and that was not at all like her. So her friends started calling around town. They started calling hospitals, police stations. At this point, they didn't know, obviously, that she had been killed. And then finally, and this part just got me because I thought to myself, imagine being in this room where somebody finally says what everyone's thinking, which is, we have to call the morgues. Hmm. They've called all the hospitals. They've called all the police stations. I wouldn't even call think to call a morgue. That's uh, uh, yeah. innovative. And it is. And I, I, yeah, I thought to myself, I don't know who would have come up with that, but that person would have had to break through an awkward silence, I imagine. Yeah. So yeah, somebody suggests, you know, we got to call a morgue and they did. And unfortunately, their worst fears were confirmed when the medical examiner told Steve Moriarty quote, it's your singer. I'm sorry. You should get someone to come down and identify her. Oh my God. And Steve, who had made this call to the morgue, uh, later said it was a lifelong traumatic moment. Yeah. Which gave me goose cam. I don't know. The phrase lifelong traumatic moment is very chilling. So, mm -hmm. of course, understandably, Mia's death shook the scene to its core. Honestly, very similar to the way Kurt Cobain's death uh, a year later would affect the grunge community as well. There was no evidence at the scene. No blood, no semen, no fingerprints, no footprints, no witnesses, and no leads. And so investigators are like, we have to consider everyone. So they took Mia's journals and they searched for clues in them. Maybe there was a jealous ex. Was there a stalker that her friends didn't know about? Uh, was it a different band, like a rival band? Um, could it have been one of her bandmates and best friends? Um, they couldn't imagine it being, but they had to. They had to check. And of course, knowing she'd been trying to find her ex, Robert Jenkins, they look into him immediately. Uh, but of course, he has an airtight alibi. He was with several other people. Joan Jett, actually, of Joan what? Jett and the Blackhearts, told Rolling Stones magazine, you can imagine this vibe that sort of came over Seattle when it happened. People just not knowing who did it. Wow. So I, ma I imagine, like, we've been talking up this whole community as, like, so close and supportive and tight-knit. And then for something like this to happen, I imagine, is very rattling because you're like, is it, some is it one of us? Yeah. You know, is it somebody yeah. that she took care of that, you know... Ooh, it's just creepy. So, you know, they didn't know who it was. They barely had any clues or virtually zero. And the suspense and fear was very damaging to the people in Mia's life. Her friends and family uh, continually spoke with journalists just trying to get the word out there for the killer to be caught. But there was an unusually number, high number of murders in the area that summer. And because of all of the, I don't know, the spike in crime, uh, police were overwhelmed with the number of investigations and the case just kind of faded away. Really? And yes. So was it like a cold case for a while? Uh, sure was. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yep. Yep. So women who either knew Mia or even knew about her were suddenly changing their habits. Um, people avoided, women especially, avoided going out alone, especially in that particular neighborhood where she had been killed. And, you know, people were thinking if her murderer were an obsessed fan, uh, maybe anyone else 
in the music scene could be the next target, right? Mm -hmm. So the community rallied behind the Gits, which was Mia's uh, chosen second family, and Steve, Joe, and Matt decided to organize benefit concerts because they needed to raise money to hire a private investigator because they wanted to get to the bottom of this. Smart. Yeah, exactly. So they are, of course, as we know, very creative, and they organized this benefit concert, which actually featured Nirvana as a special guest. Shut up. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So they, you know, Nirvana helped, uh, I think I've actually watched video clip of this like years ago but nirvana actually helped spread the word about mia trying to get some answers out there and uh the f the money came in they were able to hire a private investigator um who started her own digging and meanwhile valerie agnew of seven year bitch founded the home alive organization which provide <laughs> imagine like trying to get a loan for starting an organization you're like <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie of Seven Year Bitch. <laughs> like, well, you know they had to ask like, and what is your profession? Like, how can we yeah, right, work? Exactly. Where can we put the money? What's your co company name? Yeah, <laughs> Seven Year Bitch. Seven Year Bitch. She just, uh, yeah. Um, so she founded the Home Alive organization, which provided self defense information and resources to women. Badass, love it. In 1996, the Gits released a benefit album called Home Alive, which featured artists like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. Like wow. this, yeah, this it had a big impact on this on the on the scene. Seven Year Bitch also released their second album, which was called Viva Zapata, with songs dedicated to Mia. Wow, that's Sweet. so sad. Joan Jett actually wrote her song "Go Home." Uh, about Mia and the music video as well and dedicated it to Mia and it was released on her band's 1994 album. MTV played the music video but refused to include the dedication to Mia at the end but for some reason they never said why so we don't really know but they hmm. took that part out. The okay. Gits reached out to Joan and she recorded a live album with the Gits in 1995 and unfortunately, even though they had been able to hire this private investigator and pay her, uh, she was not able to dig up any. She she dug up some weirdos. If you watch that show I mentioned earlier, there were some weird fans who uh, okay. one 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 guy she kind of was looking into had a notebook that said God Mia Death, and uh. so she's like, well, I think we found our guy. Nope, just a weirdo. Uh, so wow. you know, she was kind of not getting anywhere. The case went cold, just like you, just like you guessed, uh, for nearly a decade. And of course, Mia's wow. loved ones were just stunned. I mean, 10 years of just no answers whatsoever. Mm. Then we get to December 2002, and that is when the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab took a DNA sample that had been swabbed nine years earlier back in 1993. Now, this was a saliva sample that uh, we've seen this a couple times. Thank God a pathologist or a medical examiner took the initiative to get that DNA swab and freeze it, mm. even though he there was no way to test it back then. He so just knew we might need this. We don't knew know. we might need it. Yes, basically took more than it, more than the evidence he needed, you know. And then when the time came and it was available for genetic testing, they had a sample that was frozen. So wonderful, love to see it. So this DNA sample was sent to the lab, and uh, it was such a small sample. Had been around for so long, they didn't really expect. Uh, all that much and so they sent it in and as expected nothing no hits no match until six months later <laughs> six months in december of 2002 the lab called back out of the blue and said someone's dna was just entered into the system and it's a match oh okay so basically this dna sample didn't match anybody in the system and then only six months later, someone's DNA gets added. It was just perfect timing. Perfect timing. So thank God uh, this hit came through and 48-year-old Cuban-born Jesus Mesquia, who's a fisherman in Florida, hmm. is the match to this sample. Was he like a mega fan or in love with her and she turned him down or... 
Nope. Okay. So they look through old police records and they discover a 1993 Seattle traffic ticket in Mesquia's name. So they place him in Seattle, even though he lives in Florida. They place him in Seattle at the time of Mia's murder. And not only that, but he was actually staying with his girlfriend who lived 12 blocks away from where Mia's body had been found. So okay. they... Well, ding, ding, ding to me. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. They fly down to Florida, but they don't want to tip him off quite yet. So they make up a ruse. And I just, <gasps> you know... I love, I love a ruse. Love Christine. a good ruse. A, there's nothing like a ruse. Nothing, nothing. like it. Nothing. So they make this ruse and they show him a number of women and asking if they've, if he's had sexual relations with them and they show a number of women. Then they show a picture of Mia and he says, no, you know, he says no to everybody. And then he says no about Mia and they say, are you sure? He says, no. I mean, yeah. he says, yes, I am sure that no, I have not had relations with this per Well, not the Bill Clinton way, but I got he you. says, no. I I <laughs> don't know. So, what they were doing is they were giving him one chance to claim that he had somehow been seeing Mia romantically, even though that would have been a stretch, ah. but he could have used that as an excuse for why his saliva was found on her. Uh -huh. But since he vehemently denied any relationship, they said, well, then your DNA must be on there for an unwilling reason and uh -huh. we are going to arrest you. So they nailed him. Good job. Good I job. love a ruse. God damn it. You know, a ruse. It's just so good. A plan. I'd rather not, but a ruse. Forget it. Oh, I'm locked in any day. Especially when it's like that, when it's, oh, we're going to trick a man. Oh, when it's justice. Yeah. Oh, done. Grunge justice. Try a ruse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so he's moved to Seattle for trial. He's sentenced to 27 years in prison after just three days of jury deliberation. That took place March 25th, 2004. And the sentence exceeded the maximum allowed sentence due to aggravating circumstances surrounding the attack, uh, which I guess was violating a previous Supreme Court ruling. So then later the sentence was overturned and Jesus was resentenced within the guidelines, but it ended up being basically the same amount of time. So sometimes the legal system makes me want to just bash my head against a wall, mm. but whatever. What? Uh, it's just confusing. Mia's wake was held in Washington and she was buried uh, in her hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. On January 21st, 2021, her killer died in prison at 66 years old. And Steve, uh, who we had discussed earlier, told Rolling Stone, I was actually thinking for years how I would react when he was released. He was a profoundly distracting influence on my life for the last 25 years. Good riddance. Mm. Steve is full of these zingers. He's the one who said a lifelong trauma or whatever. Like he's, I he's feel got like words he should... for days get the band back together in 2002 yeah. or whenever it was even today get the do a reunion show with all the people who helped bring the killer oh you know and like bring uh mia's killer to justice yeah like, like, an honorary, alive anymore, like a tribute though, is she? Uh, she? i thought she was but maybe she's not let's find out Who is this podcast Janet just Joplin. us figuring Oh, Janice Joplin's certainly not alive, but yeah. uh, Joan yeah. Jett is, yeah, she's only 65. Yeah, so Joan Jett and the Gits should get back together. Absolutely. Do a little beep boop bop. Look what we did. Fuck this guy. They should do a a, a grunge to Kerplunge or whatever I said, because I feel like <laughs> they did a fun like twist on uh, the genre, a genre twist, genre bender, if you will. I love um, it. Well, I feel like I would, TikTok would eat that shit up, you know? That's what I'm saying. Just saying. Just anyway, saying. if you know anybody who knows anybody who knows them, <laughs> you let them know that that was our idea, and then they do. Yeah, it. yeah. And then we get credit. That's all I'm saying. Because I want. We're not very. We're not punk enough to say we don't want the credit for it. <laughs> what is What does your shirt say again? It says, "Someone in Fall Out Boy loves me." <laughs> okay, so that's the kind of vibe we're we're offering. And if you, that's yeah, of you interest know, you, to you, Joan Jett, you then get, you let us know. You you get what you see you see what you get you know that whole thing yeah um, nothing special just a couple of rats that are not welcome to the rat's nest or whatever it's called little dirty rats in our own rat nest yeah speaking of rats everybody okay wait my story is not done though okay but you remind me when it's time okay okay we can okay. drink the water now i just didn't know if you thought that the story was over 
No, I, I need to do it. We need to do it. We need to do it afterwards. So you, you finish first. Oh, after. Okay, great. Okay. So Steve said, uh, you know, he's this asshole murderer has been a profoundly distracting influ- influence on my life. Good riddance. The Gits released a statement that said Mia Zapata was an extraordinary human being. She was a beloved friend, a gifted songwriter, musician, visual artist, and performer. Rather than focusing on her death, we prefer to remember her friendship, talent, humor, and the incredible art and music she left to the world. And thankfully, those things have not been forgotten. Mia and the Gits music still continue to thrill and motivate fans and aspiring artists, new young people entering the genre. And the Home Alive organization has also left its mark, which is great because, of course, they provide safety resources and support to anybody who needs it. Um, And so they've made a big mark as well. Mia herself is considered an important figure in the legacy of Latina women in the punk rock and Riot Girl musical movements. And according to Joan Jett, who's very much alive, as we just discovered, (laughs) her, (laughs) her legacy should be beautiful strong punk rock music coming from a woman's perspective because that's who she was Mm. mia's emotions music and voice were too powerful to be silenced and her own experiences that she shared through music still resonate with global audiences today as you can probably tell and that is the story of the murder of mia zapata wow what what a what a character she is that was um you know, in the darkest sense, one of my favorite stories you've done. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah I'm was, so happy uh, to hear that. I mean, yours was one of my favorites we've ever done. So, oh, stop. Eva, it. write that down because <laughs> some, someday we'll go. We'll never, we never like any of our episodes, and then Eva can be like, "You said you liked this one on air." So, also, Eva, yeah. can you write down the um <laughs> that one of the funniest things that's happened recently is last week when I said fee fi fo fum in reference to me <laughs> trick-or-treating as a giant as a child <laughs> <laughs> i forgot about i absolutely forgot about that for yeah, like an audio was bit that too. was just about one of my favorites um <laughs> i forgot about that that was was that the same episode as corny sean con because i think we... <laughs> no corny sean con that didn't happen in an episode that was in our oh. after chat no one knows oh shit that's a patreon only you guys can't know about it it's we're making so shirts we have to make a shirt oh we have to make shirts <gasps> can that be our patreon exclusive item like y- yes you can't that buy could be our patreon oh my god exclusive. oh my god eva 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 oh my god yes yeah if you if you join our patreon you just might be getting a a shirt that says on se voit à la corny chacon and you won't even know what you it means you just might you just might you just might you better get on it it's kind of a big deal <laughs> it's kind of a big deal okay anyway okay with that, anyway. folks, <laughs> uh, thank you, Christine, for your your grand storytelling. And oh wow, you're so welcome. Thank you. I've for... already found them, and um, I, I've already found them. I'm gonna go add them on Spotify. And the pl- yes, hell yes, I'm gonna do that too. All right, uh, and that's why we drink. <laughs>